All right, so being at least seven o'clock, I am going to call the Hadley Conservation Commission meeting to order. First item on the agenda is a, no, a continued Sorry. notice of intent it's public hearing. Right. Um, notice of intent public hearing number 170 276 for J and M Boisfort who seek to redevelop riverfront area of the Mill River at 6 French Street, map 6B, parcel 47. Now, I know that that um, had been continued because there were a number of questions um, that needed to be answered. And we did receive something uh, about Let's see, we did get some uh, information. Janice, did that come in today? Yes, this afternoon. Okay, so we did get a number of um, reply about, I think it was about 2, 2.30, somewhere around there today. <clears throat> so I'm asking uh, if someone need here is here from the Boy Sverts. Um, if you can address the commission. Sure, good evening. Am I logged on? Can everybody hear me? Yep. Oh. Thank you. Okay, it's so. Yep. The way you're approaching that. It's, it's not fair to her to have strings attached to that. What was that? I don't know. Um, so yes, um, we've got our application to redevelop or rebuild the house at 6 French Street. And uh, yeah, so there was a series of questions that came in um, prior to last meeting that we just weren't prepared to answer, but tonight we have a fair amount of them answer, we believe, for you. So would you like me to start with the questions that Janice um, emailed us? Is that the best way to get started here? Yes, please. Okay, so she oh, questioned... I get that. I get that. She questioned a um, few trees, actually a total number of five trees okay, that we would like to sorry, remove. I'm sorry, Joe. If somebody, if people don't have their mics muted, I don't know if that's in the background by you, Joe, or if that is. No, it's not here. Okay. No. So if you are not speaking, um, could you please mute yourself? Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Okay, so. Starting off in the project on Friend Street, there are five trees along the bank um, behind the house that we are requesting to remove. Um, one reason is one of them is just a standing about a 30 foot trunk. Um, the other four have terrible leans in towards where the house is gonna be built, um, which are gonna be troublesome for us to you know, rebuild the house. Um, one particular tree is right in the location of the shed zone that needs to be cleaned up that we are all aware of. So there's a total of five trees. Um, two of them, we feel very comfortable that we can remove because they're on the smaller side. Three of them are larger and we have contacted Northeast Tree Service um, who has a crane that could back down the existing driveway and properly um, remove the trees leaving the stumps intact on the bank um, remove them out of there and, and remove them off the property. Um, so we are asking to remove the five completely from like three quarters to almost near the top of the bank zone to take them down and remove them off the property completely. That was the first question that was asked. And Joe, you know, can I ask you, are those flagged or marked in the field or are they shown on a picture somewhere because i've got okay. the pictures and i can share them if i need to yeah so what... yeah sorry for interrupting yeah shelly did my wife did take the pictures of them but um you know possibly maybe they're not that clear for everybody so um what i'd like to do is that i don't expect to get through all this tonight with you guys because there's a lot with this project but if we could set up a site plan visit, um, we could have them marked for whoever can come to the site and physically see what we're talking about, I think would be the best representation of what is going on. So we can have them mapped, uh, tagged um, prior to a, you know, a site plan visit with you folks. Okay. Okay, so if I could continue with the questions, because I know you've got a million people here tonight and a lot of things going on. So. Another question was, um, what do we mean by uh, bringing back the lawn areas on both sides of the house 
You need a better explanation. So I have that. Um, so basically this is an extremely small property. For those of you who have not been down there, it's only about 8,200 square feet. So it's very, very small. Um, with the house and the driveway, there's not a lot of lawn. But on the north side of the house, there was, there was existing lawn there. We'd like to finish hand clipping like little stubbles and vines that are sticking out. Um, if there's a little sumac stump or something, we'd like to grind it and not dig the ground and add some of the Hadley you know, loam and seed the north side of that house. The south side of the driveway is a smaller area, which one of the neighbors has a, like a little rock ravine through it that looks really cute that we realized when we surveyed the property is kind of on our property, which we don't have a problem with. Um, and we'd like to dedicate that area for more natural wetland plantings and bushes on that side, which I can get to further in the explanation of why we're asking to do native vegetation over there um, as we continue on. So that's, I guess, what we meant about in the site plan map, you know, to put it back to some lawn and to kind of put it back to what most of us people are used to when we live in the house is to have a little bit of grass area. I guess keep going. Would you like me to keep going, Paula? Yep. Okay. Um, so that one there, we kind of basically talked about that. So there was a question on um, what we said, redo the driveway in quotations, um, more explanation on the driveway. So. There's a pre-existing concrete driveway, approximately ranging from 12 feet to 13 feet wide from the edge of the asphalt road to the very end of the driveway is about 50 feet. So if we average the 12 to 13, 12, six, keep it at 12, whatever. Um, that is the existing broken up concrete driveway. We would really like to remove the concrete, put a proper gravel base under that existing driveway and asphalt paved that um, when our project is completed, but that is the very last step kind of of the project because you know that's kind of how that stuff is done. Um, the concrete, it was question, what would we do with the concrete? Delta sand and gravel in Sunderland um, takes that stuff in, it, it, it's, you pay by the weight and they crush it up in there and they reuse it in gravel aggregate up there at the plant. That's where that material would be going off of that site, the delta sand and gravel. Um, so then it goes down to, let's see here. Um, there's some question on the chain link fence and the split, uh, split rail fence that we've requested to put up along the bank. So I'm not quite sure if there's some confusion on the safety chain link fence that we opted to put up around the whole entire property along with a silt, um, barrier and, um, the bales of hay around there. When we did the demolition back in, was that December or early January? I forget when we did the demolition, but <laughs> that that was our choice to do that, just to make sure that that demolition job did not have any, you know, issues for us or anybody else. So, so we did that. So, beyond that chain link fence by about two to three feet, because I did put the safety fence up as tight as I could on top of the bank. There's an old chain link fence a safety fence for the people that obviously live there um, that has basically fallen down, tree branches have crushed it down and there's invasive vines growing through it. That is also part of the reason why some of those trees are dead is because of the invasive vine that is crawling up them and choking them out. We would like to remove the old chain link fence, which is a little bit beyond the safety fence and replace that with a nice like split rail post rail fence um, to finish this project off when that time comes. So that section there where you asked me on that, um, that is exactly um, how, I, uh, how we explain that there. And I do wanna just back up, and I know maybe just uh, Paulette has the pictures, but there are pictures of the, con uh, the concrete driveway, I believe in your presence. I don't know if anybody, needs to look at it or if you can if you'd like to look at the photos after that's totally fine with me on that too um why don't we keep going uh, okay i have one question on the old fence sure. um is it installed 
with concrete footings? Are you just going to cut it off at the ground? Are you going to try and dig out if there's any type of concrete where the posts are in? So um, I don't have the answer to that because I didn't go that far in seeing how it was installed. But personally, um, spending several days and months scratching my head on the cleanup of the existing shed um, and growing up here in North Hadley, there's a lot of Red Rock Ledge. So um, I know there's not a lot of loam soil above it. So regardless of the fact, I have no problems just scratching around if the pipe goes in a little bit and cutting it off and leaving it at that. So whatever is there can stay there to hold, you know what I'm saying, whatever is pre-existing. Okay. All right. Um, then I was also asked back in December when we submitted stuff, um, was our intent to either replace the garage or shed um, and we did not put that on the notice of intent. Um, I will tell you primarily why we didn't. Um, I've talked to people. I believe we are entitled because of most of the footings are there to possibly navigate putting that shed back up on the existing piers if we really want to. What we really want to do here is maybe take that space and ask for the farmer's porch extension and the deck on the house and take that degrading area and put it back into vegetative plantings, um, which I'll further explain as we go on. So um, as of right now, no, it was not in the DEP or the notice of intent plan. Um, we just didn't know how to go forward with that at the time. Um, then I was asked also, which is the big question on this project, the removal of the old shed, which has slid down the bank which some of it is within 10 feet of the actual running water um, down below. Um, now, this is a huge challenge. And what I mean by that is we have a pre-existing um, town water ditch drainage rainstorm water problem directly across the street from this property. So directly across the street from the property is a town culvert which accepts water from all the way up from 17 Mount Warner Road. And that water flows down and crosses um, right across from my property at six Mount Warner Road, goes underground under the property um, at five Mount Warner, which is a residential property. Then the culvert pipe resumes out into an open ditch along French Street and goes to a town owned catch basin right where there's a little red shed directly across from our driveway. Now, it has been a known DPW problem that either that pipe that accepts that amount of water is undersized or blocked. And nobody has ever pushed to try to figure out this problem because the person living in the property that we have bought at 6 French Street obviously really didn't care because she never paid the town. And this is why it became a town property and now became my property. But the shed down the bank has a lot to do with the culvert pipe not accepting the volume of water sheeting across French Street, racing down the driveway, and it has clearly washed that shed down to the bare red rock, you know, bedstone there is what has happened. So Shelly and I, my wife and I are a little bit um, complex on how to go forward with you guys, and we're looking, we're open for options. We did say hard pack and maybe some rip wrap, uh, rip wrap rocks and like some kind of pipe system to help collect that and feed it out to the, to the Mill River. But after reading the feedback from um, Janice, um, the big problem starts with the road. So maybe Paulette, you could give me some feedback. I did reach out to Scott McCarthy, who's a field super supervisor for the DPW, who has spoken with Chris Okerford, who said they are aware of this problem but the first big problem is they believe the pipe goes under the barn for starters. And so for them to rectify the problem, they have to then dig the road. So we kind of got a little bit bigger issue here. So I don't know how to properly clean up the shed, try to rectify my property without it continue to, you know, continuing to wash down the bank. So I guess yeah. I'd, I'd like some feedback, you know, from any of the members on how you think 
personal residents should address this problem? Well, I guess one question was, I wasn't aware that there's a culvert across the street or a catch basin in there. I, we saw, when I was out there, we saw the ditch along the side of the road. We could see where the water ran adjacent to the road. There is a crown on the road, but it actually should be raised on your side so that it all drains to the ditch. I mean, that's the, the proper construction of the road should be like that so that your side is higher and it, and it doesn't have a crown because there's no place for the water to go on your side. But when all that water comes down, do we know where the outlet for that pipe is? Even though if, if it's crushed or full, do we know where it discharges now? Yes, we do. So if you look at photos one, two, and three that I have submitted to the committee, um, the water is supposed to go into that catch base and it continue going south down Friend Street into the other open, um, I don't know what you want to properly call it, but I guess I'll have to call it a ditch swale um, right before 47. That accepts the water there and then it fires it through a pipe system into the mill river right there um, where 47 S corner bridges is what, what it does. But the volume of water coming down, they really believe it definitely runs during the rainstorms and thunderstorms, but it is just undersized or there's a blockage that they can't locate. It just does not accept the amount of water. So yes, there's a crown in the driveway, but if I do anything on my side of the road, I'm being, I'm being very disrespectful to my neighbors because then I'm gonna now pose a huge water flood problem for them. And while I'm at the position I'm in here, I'd rather fix the problem than make the neighbors hate me. Well, what, what we noticed when I was out there is that the person, I guess, to the north of you they actually have their their lawn is actually elevated to keep the runoff on the road versus going into their driveway and that was kind of the idea of for Janice's comment to you know change that um, but really what it needs is the road itself needs to be constructed at an angle so your side of the road is higher and all of the runoff goes to the ditch on the opposite side of the road. But that's not gonna help if there is a blockage there. So we're gonna need to, um, I didn't know that there was a culvert there. So we're gonna have to, when we go out to do a site visit, it would be good to look at that, see if we can trace it see anywhere where it goes, at least see where the discharge is or supposed to be and try and figure out where to go from there. Okay, I mean, that sounds very fair to me because personally, I think the town issue should be the town issue and that should be fixed. Um, I never would have thought that, you know, you guys would allow me raising up the property to sheet the water off it as an option, but if that's an option, and that helps me out, then great. Um, but you know, when we have these heavy rainstorms and early snow melts, it, it definitely is a problem. So continuing on about the shed down the bank, um, that is where we presented doing some kind of retaining block at the end of the driveway with a pipe to accept this water and kind of shoot it out into the Mill River where it ends up going anyways just an additional 100 feet south on French Street to help my property not erode any further. Um, so if we could rectify the problem across the street with the town water and the heavy rains, I am 100% all about putting loamy soil back in there on top of the red rock bed, leaving any pre-existing concrete, any kind of pipe, anything that's into the earth or ground, kind of let it stay there to hold that bank and get some native vegetation planted there because that is more what we wanted than having some kind of pipe throat accepting water. It's just kind of an ugly looking thing at the end of the driveway. But that was the way we really felt we would have to approach this. 
we still may have to if the town doesn't do their part in fixing the problem. And it's been a known problem and it actually stems back to Mike Klamoski, the highway boss, and I talked to him and he kind of chuckled and he's like, nobody ever really pushed that. You know what I mean? So it's a, it's a known problem on French Street. Um, the poor lady that lived there prior to the town taking it over, you know, just never really did anything about it because she really didn't have much, I guess. And, and here we are today. So um, I think the site plan visit with all you folks or whoever will definitely help. Um, maybe some support from you to the DPW might help to see what we can do with this project and we can move forward from there. Joe and Paulette, if I could jump in. It's Alex Bilodeau, I'm Joe's neighbor on French Street. I've been dealing with the same issue um, with the runoff from the road. And I've I've left my own makeshift silt fence up along the riverbank because the water does run off the street when that ditch on the opposite side backs up and it all comes across like a tidal wave. Um, so correcting that would be unbelievably helpful. Yeah, are you on, like if I'm looking at where the foundation is and the river's behind it, are you the left or the right? I'm closer to Mount Warner, so I'd be to the right. To the right, okay. Thank you. Yeah, one of the, and this is where something that we really need, we should get that cleared up because for us to allow um, a point source discharge, because when you put it into the pipe like that, um, directly into a water that's a fisheries, um, we cannot allow that. So that's where most people do pretreatment and then, you know, it's discharged over land and then it gets discharged to the water. So it's in not only your best interest, but for the fisheries and the town's best interest to let's try and, and deal with this issue. Well, that sounds great to me. And if I have to be the DPW's um, new best friend, I certainly will do that. So, so pa oh, excuse me, Joe. Paul, that's a process question. Joe's going to talk through these points and then we're going to have a, a site visit and we'll have the benefit of all the plans and everything. Yeah, we've got Just from a we process all, standpoint. We were given a set of plans. Right. Um, for the, I think, last meeting in April. Right, 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 right. And, but we've, you know, additional comments were given. Right. Um, so I know we are going to, we will end up continuing this, but the best thing to do is because they've addressed all the issues, yeah. figure out if there's anything else. We know that that pipe and the discharge is gonna be an issue. Right. And then we'd wanna see where the trees are Yep. So if we can get through, like, knock off all most of the issues, then we can go forward and not have a lot to continue. Right. And then, ref, I guess, refine it or get, get additional input on an intervening site visit, right, before the next yes. meeting? Is that the idea? Yep. Yes. Okay. Okay. So then additional questions. I'm going to try to keep moving here. Um, it was regarding um, adding the deck to the north of the house. Wait a minute, Joe, can you talk about taking the removal of the shed? We kind of okay. got off. Oh, yeah. Yep. So, okay. Getting back to that, um, I've been really scratching my head. And honestly, I feel the best and safest way to do it is with having a climbing harness on and some ropes and manually cut the boards in part of the shed that's down the bank um, compile it. And I have two methods I think that are gonna work great. Both of the me methods um, involve some kind of truck sitting on the driveway that's currently there. One would be a long truck with a cherry picker grapple that could reach over the bank and pick up my pre-made piles, bring the debris up onto the driveway, swing around, load it into a dumpster. If the cherry picker is not long enough to grab, which it probably is not, I also talked to Jason Keitza who owns Northeast Tree who has that large crane. He said we could buy, I could buy those dumpster bags they're called, which are very strong. He could hook them to his crane, lower them down. We could fill it with the debris. He could hoist it back up and then we could load it right into a dumpster to take the debris to um, Valley Recycling in East Hampton to be done with. Um, any tires, there are some, absolutely. We're gonna pick them up. 
Um, any other broken glass we can pick up? Yes. There are some um, concrete that has rolled down, some old footings that are like stuck in the bank. I was hoping that we could leave that all there to hold what's there and get the trashy, let's say, debris cleaned up and then see if we can put a little bit of loamy material and some kind of plantings to try to hold that. It might still be a little bit of a challenge because we have a lot of red rock. It's all red rock ledge there. So, you know, I may do it once and we may have some, you know, wash out again. I did talk to Ward Smith, who's helping me out um, with this wetlands project. He said, Joe, um, there's no way to put a silt fence down there. Um, it's just not safe. It's not conducive. Um, but growing up in North Hadley, I actually played in the water down there. On normal water levels, there's only about eight inches to a foot of water down there. It's all red rock. I have no problem going down there and being the person in the water if something slides down and grabbing it. You know what I mean? And we can get it put back on the bank and up that way. And I have no problem if somebody from this committee wants to spend the day there making sure that we're not floating boards down the river. That's not what we do and, and we wouldn't do it. But I'm just telling you, I think the safest and best way is and least invasive is safety harnesses and ropes and manually get the debris up the bank. It is pretty darn steep when you stand on that bank. And if you slide, most of the dirt has a little bit of moisture under it and then you got the red rock and you're gone. Oh yeah, you definitely need to be tied off. That seems, yeah. seems reasonable uh, from my standpoint and certainly um, until the water issues dealt with, I, it doesn't seem like, you know, knowing how to move forward with any kind of putting anything else on there <laughs> is going to make much sense. It's all just going right. to get washed out. Right. So getting anything right. else established, I mean, the debris there may be what's, you know, slowing down the sheet flow over the edge. So once you get rid of that, uh, you know, unless you deal with the source of all that erosion. That is correct. As much as I want to get the debris cleaned up and, and I was going to ask the commission if, if there's any possibility to do a couple small steps in here, but we can discuss that after. And if not, that's fine. But um, Jim, you're absolutely right. I'm not quite sure if I address the debris problem, if I'm going to lose more of the land erosion because of the, you know, water. I, it's a double-edged sword. So yes. Mm -hmm. um, so I hope that answers your question on um our plan to remove the debris from that bank. Yep. Okay, next question was asked to me. Um, regarding the deck on the north side of the house and uh, the extension of the farmer's porch to the south, you guys wanted a little bit more detail on that. Um, I hired TNT consultants or engineers, which is Tim Nyhart and his wife. They do blueprints and they did a blueprint for the house um, with an extension of the farmer's porch on the driveway south side of the house. Um, there's new things called diamond piers where it's a concrete block that is basically you hand shovel about eight inches down, you set the pier in, and there's a series of um, threaded or re-rod that gets driven in at multiple angles. And believe it or not, and I have a hard time believing it too, that it, it meets code for building on. Um, I guess some old fashioned with sauna tubes and goes deep as you can and hope you don't get a frost heave. You know what I mean? But this is new code, so it, it's very non-evasive to the land. So to do the farmer's porch extension, because there was a pre-existing farmer's porch for 20 or 22 feet of the 40 feet that we're asking for. So we're asking for an additional 20 feet. Um, and then we're asking for the deck to the north. Um, those diamond piers would be used for the footings for those two extensions off the foundation. Okay, so by doing that, and that's where part of the question was, because that was, that's considered riverfront area, that would have to be, the, that square footage was not degraded with asphalt or concrete. So that's a new, um, new work in there. And that would have to be, um, mitigated. Okay. And so that's what we were asking about. If you were going to be doing mitigation for those areas, where would that be? So I guess the answer to that question, Paulette, 
so the new work um, would be about a hundred and let me see if I got this right here. So about 103 square feet on the farmer's porch on the south side and about 158 square feet is about the deck area. Um, I was hoping to explain this project with the cleaning up of the de degrading shed that has degraded what Randy Iser has figured almost 1,046 square feet of down the bank that's degraded. And the south side of the driveway adding that into vegetative plantings that I know there's some kind of ratio and it's, it's I, I, I don't know how to calculate it um, in that zone because it's very weird. I'm sure maybe one or two of you could help me walk through it. It's like a two to one based on this, that, I, I don't know it. But I was hoping saying that if we're taking 1,046 square feet of pre-existing degrading mess, cleaning it up, putting vegetating plants back and giving more vegetated um, stuff to the south of the driveway that the committee would possibly grant that total of the tool, which is about 260 to 270 square feet of new construction in a zone that I need to rectify why I, you should allow me to do it. Okay, and we can look at that when we're out so we can okay. look at the area that you're proposing for um, restoration. Okay. That, like on the south, you're stocking the south side of the driveway. Absolutely, that's fine. It sounds like also thinking about mitigation for lawn. So you're asking to to, to um, cut back some natural vegetation and plant some lawn in. So that would be mitigation as well, I believe. Well, the the north side of the house, um, Tony Lynn was always lawn there. Um, okay. I'm not quite sure how to explain. It, it was never a pretty lawn. The last three years at the town or two and a half years at the town had the ownership. I don't have the exact time frame. Um, occasionally, one of the DPW employees would take the brush hog of the tractor when they were doing road work and they would kind of back in and, and kind of keep it trimmed up a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Because it was sitting fallow. So um, the lady prior to that always mowed the north side of the house. A lot of what's on the north side of the house, believe it or not, is old shingles that blew off the house, nails, like just trashy debris, I guess I could call it that. Yeah, what we would look at is in order to calculate the degraded area, we could look at the old assessor's maps, the aerials and calculate, uh, I believe Janice's date was like 1995, what was existing there in 95. And then we can look at if it was lawn there previously, which I'm assuming it was, if it was a house, um, then that would be what was existing there. And we can look at the amount kind of given uh, a pretty good estimate as to the amount of, you know, pavement um, versus grass versus if there was any area on the lot that was considered like natural vegetation. So we can look at that too. And that will give us a good idea of what existed there. Okay. Um, next on the list that you guys asked me to do here is um, rebuild the house and the existing foundation quote unquote, um, I guess there's a lot of controversy here and I'll, I'll just um, try to say that um, Tim Nyhart issued a letter, I believe to Janice that um, I'm hoping you have regarding that. This was um, one of those gray areas that there was a lot of misunderstanding. Um, Tommy Quinlan, the building inspector along with Tim Nyhart, our engineer, um, we did not, the foundation was iffy in spots and great in spots. Um, when we did the repair to the foundation, we did absolutely zero excavation. And 98% of the work was done on the interior of the foundation, okay? Tim Nyhart at the point of when the house came down did not know if that foundation would be suitable enough to build a new house on without seeing what the repairs could do or how we could proceed with the repairs or what the structure of the flagstone stones were 
and all that stuff. So Tommy Quinn and we, we got together and we decided let's let's do this, see where we're at. Um, because I did not know how to go forward with the notice of intent. If they told me the foundation was crap, then I needed to put in the notice of intent that I'm planning on now digging this whole entire foundation out and you know going forward that way. So I'm hoping um some of the conversations I believe that have happened with Paula, I think, and maybe Tommy Quinlan about that, or the letter that came from the engineer um, might satisfy that question that was asked to me. And I'm going to kind of leave it at that because um, I guess that's all I can say at the moment. Yeah. One of the issue was in actually in the plans that you submitted that we had, it talked about doing excavation on the foundation. So that's where that came in and that was um because if you look at the plans it actually talks about excavating the front part of the foundation of the house and re-pouring and recasting a new foundation there so that's where some of the comments about um new construction or what you were going to do in there that's where those comments came from basically the review of the plans that were submitted. Okay, so look new the, in the fine print on the building plan. It actually talks about excavating and removal and reconstructing the foundation. Okay, so I I cannot um, say either way. It probably did say that then, but just to let you know, make clarification. Um, and Tommy Quinley can um, verify it for you guys. There was no machinery there at all other than the day of the demolition of the house. Um, all the foundation work was manual hand work above ground. You know, nothing was removed. And I believe the letter that um, Tim Nyhart sent in verifies that we did not do any disturbing or going beyond any means of the measurement of the house based on his prior measurements before the demolition and the measurements after. Okay. We did get that letter. Uh, Tim delivered it today and it seems fine. He signed it saying it's exactly the same footprint as before. Okay, thank you. Hey, moving on. Um, and this is something I need your guidance from. At the bottom of page two, I guess we had checked off buffer zone only on the DEP application. Um, and I guess you're asking and telling me that that's not correct. So I'm answering it as, okay, we must have made a mistake. And is there a way to change that then to what um, it needs to be changed to? Um, and I know there's some other stuff in there about um, the debris removal in there and then the trap rock and stuff like that. And what I'm trying to say in, in this whole synopsis of 6 French Street is I don't want to use riprap and, and hardback if we can rectify the water problem. Um, so that section is kind of, I guess, just some paperwork that maybe we can change that and um, move forward with that. Um, the next section was just a little bit more. Their next question was on the degrading area compared to um, the, the new work. Um, so I think we're basically talking the same thing in that section. So I'm gonna try to keep moving here. Um, Let's see, concerning the plan by um, Eaton and Associates. Okay, the plan didn't have a legend on it, which I'm assuming you didn't mean, you, I'm assuming you didn't mean north, south, east, and west, but more like for a linear foot or footage so you could get a better um, assessment of like the width of the drive and the length of the driveway, for example, and stuff. Yeah, um, it was just so you understand, when we looked at the plan, what we saw, there were a lot of lines and it was hard to determine, you know, there were arrows pointing all over. Well, this is this line and that's that. Typically on a plan, you have a set, like a, a line, like a, a, a dash and a dot, a dash and a dot, and that would depict something in particular. And here it was, it was a little confusing on there, so. Okay, and I did review that site plan and, and I do, do understand what you're saying, but everything that Randy did put in, if you, and I know it takes a little bit, if you look at it, it, it is, it's, I think mostly there, but I do understand what you mean about maybe it could have been laid out a little bit better for your viewing or, you know, just quick look for understanding. Um, I guess that's something at, at our site plan that 
if it's not clear enough, we can go back to the drawing board on that, I guess, and 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 yeah. and have them redo it and get it to um, the specs that you guys will accept. Yeah, it was just a problem when we copied in in black and white. Oh, okay. The, lines, the colors disappear, so that right. was the, the hard part there. <clears throat> Okay, so the next question you asked me pretty much. Um, we talked about this. Is the same thing. Okay. Um, oh, so it says you need, we need a clear rep representation of what was previously developed and degraded before August 7th of 96. I need to ask the board do you have a way to prove that? I don't know how to find that. Um, <laughs> the, in the assessor's aerials. That's okay, what I was so talking about. We can look at the assessor's maps and the GIS. They have photographs going back into the 90s. So Okay, so then prior to the site plan, I can dig that up and we can all dig it up and we can review it then. Um, so, uh, Joe, um, last winter before the demolition of the house, um, I talked to Randy Iser about that and he said he would go out and uh, delineate that before the snowstorm that day so that he had it because I gave him the information from the wetland regulations about previously developed and degraded. So he said, okay, I'll run right out and do that. So I think he did some of it and I just don't know if that's all of it. Maybe that is all of it um, that's on there, but it doesn't actually state it or you know describe it or label it, I guess, um, with what's there. Okay, and maybe Randy does have that in his presence and maybe, you know what I mean? Because I know he's been out there several times, um, you know, working for us and doing stuff. Yeah, and I told him he needed that before you could start the demolition, just so that we had the footprint of any of the developed and disturbed area, degraded area before the work began. Gotcha, and I know he was out there and I know Tim Nyhart was out there well before the house left the foundation also. So he may have that information for you already. Yeah. You just need to see it on a plan somewhere. If he's okay. He may have that already. Gotcha. Okay, moving forward. Um, you asked me um, the mean annual high water line marked by others. Who marked it? Um, it was marked by Ward Smith, a Wendell Wetlands consultant. And it was actually completed Tuesday morning, January 12th. Um, he also confirmed to us that there's no bordering vegetated uh -huh. wetlands on this property. Um, and that's from him and he's working for us on this project. Couldn't be here tonight because just like everybody else, he's got a million you know, things going on. He just could not. Um, you also asked me that you need a side view of the proposed grading at the end of the driveway in the location and extent of the, of the grading. You know, I really don't know what you meant by the side view at the end of the driveway. It's just maybe you meant something. I just didn't pick up what you were exactly saying. Uh, what I was saying was like if you're if you're looking at it from like a side view, I don't know if you call that a cross section or sure. something like that. Just yeah. have some sense of how much of a bump or a hill or grading you're going to be doing if you're looking at it from the side. Um, it, it there was just an area that was marked as you know like uh, I think fill and and rock or something like that, and there really wasn't any idea of how high that was or how it was going to, you know, what it was going to look like. Yeah. So if there's going to be any changes in elevation on the driveway um, to accommodate either the water or for, um, you know, changing the elevation to put riprap in or anything like that, that's what that would be for. Okay, and some of these questions, I think, um, to the committee and everybody and to myself, could be better answered once we do that site plan and maybe get more information from the DPW because it kind of goes hand in hand on how I can proceed with this. Um, and then the final last question um, that you guys asked, the plan needs to identify all areas for pro proposed gravel, riprap pavement and all their such material with the square footage and et cetera. So if we can rectify the problem over the bank, there, there will be no hard pack or riprap if we can rectify that problem. Um, the driveway square footage area, once the uh, concrete is removed, there will be a gravel base put in there to hold the, the new um, asphalt driveway. But that is the only area that we need to bring in material other than some loam on the north side. Once we navigate, hopefully through seeing that down to a lawn, 
and, and, mm -hmm. and, and then we're gonna just do some nice plantings around the house. So all in all, this is an extremely small footprint in a very challenging area, I guess we can say, but I think if I can get you folks out there to physically walk it and see it with me, I think we can put the package together where it makes sense to everybody. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah, makes sense. Yep. Okay. We want to have a site visit. Yep. So when do our people available? Let's try and if we can set something After up. After five o'clock. Five o'clock works for me because I don't get out of um, Springfield till like four fifteen. Okay. At five o'clock. Name yeah. the day. I'm I'm available. I don't know about everybody else. I'll be there. Okay, we got Steve, we got Edwin, we've got me. Who else? Depends on the day I can be available. Okay. So pick what day this. works for you, Jim? Um let's see. What next Tuesday? Or Tony Lynn, next week. Next Tuesday is what the Yeah, that works for me. 18th. Um yep. or no. I couldn't no, I can't I couldn't do it till six. Okay. The nineteenth? I could do the nineteenth. I could Yeah, do I can't the, do the nineteenth, but we don't all have to be there, right? Yeah. And we don't have to right. yeah. so we can figure this out over email. Does it yeah. um Joe, does the Tuesday or Wednesday work for you on at five o'clock next week? I, I can absolutely make any time work. Obviously, you know how it is on the farm, we're always around, so just Give me the date and time and I'll be there. Okay. So right. it'll either be next Tuesday or Wednesday. We just got to figure it out. Yeah. Totally, totally fine. You can let me know. We don't have to, you know, do this tonight if you don't want to. I understand you got a bazillion yeah. things and I chewed up a solid hour. So. Yeah. Okay. All, All right. right. So we Thanks. will thank you. We will schedule the site visit for either next Tuesday or Wednesday. Um does any commissioners have any other questions or things that you want addressed? Because we will continue this. Um, I do have a question for the commission. Um, I am looking at if we could hold one more meeting in two weeks only to deal with stuff that's on this agenda, not adding anything else. Works for me. Let's do it. Yeah. We're yeah. never going to get everything done tonight. Yeah, no, I can but, do it. Okay, so that, but this, I'm looking at, we won't add anything else to the agenda. It will only be oh. that would be continued. There's no way you can. We're going to hold it. We're going to hold you to that, too. Uh, I've already, Janice and I have already had that conversation. Okay. <laughs> Nothing else. I guess I just want to say, um, how do you, and how, Joe, how do you say your last name? I, don't want to sound too <laughs> French when I say it. Well, it's supposed to be Boisvert or French, but it right. got very Americanized, and we say Boisvert. Okay, <laughs> I thought if I said Boisvert, it might sound a little too fancy, nope. but um, <laughs> Mr. Boisvert, um, thank you for all your work on this. It's a lot of work, and so we appreciate all the thought and attention you're putting in and to do this right, so thank you. Yes. Thank you. Good. All right, so... Um, Commission members, do you have any other questions or anything you want us to look at? And then if not, I need a motion to continue um, two weeks from tonight. So moved. The Second. Fourth. Is the 25th. 25th. Right? So 525, at, um, seven o'clock. So I had a motion. Did I have a second? Yep. Okay. Um, any further discussion? Nope. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Yeah. All right. Thank you, Joe. We will see you next Tuesday or Wednesday, and we will Contact. see you in two weeks. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So now we have a notice of intent public hearing 170-279. Um, for M. Britain seeks to place up up to five recreational vehicles and a dock for seasonal use in the riverfront area and 100-year floodplain at 93 Cemetery Road. Again, we got some information in today on that property. 
Um, Janice, do you want to just go over quick what we got in? I know we had a number of things that we had requested. Um, okay, um, I'll try. I just realized I have some things in the wrong place. Um, we got an updated map and also um, a response about um, an alternatives analysis on the riverfront. And uh, we also got um, a couple pages of the notice of intent and the uh, waterways permit application um, updated, adding the name of the co-owner of the property. And um, I'm trying to think uh, he also has got a response that hg &E has received his um, chapter 91 license application. And I have not had a time to go through it all in detail, but that's generally, I believe, and Mark can tell me if I'm missing anything else on that. All right. So, um, hello. Uh, hello. My name, my name is Gerald Trahey. I, I spoke for Lionel before just last week, and I'm speaking on behalf of uh, Mr. Britton uh, tonight. Hi, hello, everybody. Um, yes, I, I believe you received a, uh, um, I believe you received a memorandum, some uh, updated map, some uh, some affidavits today. Um, yeah. If you'd like, I can, I'll run through the, uh, the memo or the justification. Uh, I probably do it fairly quickly. A lot of the issues are the same as uh, everything that when we went into detail uh, on two weeks ago with the divorce property. It probably will be the same, a lot of the same issues that you address uh, the other RVs I see on the agenda. Thanks. You want them to summarize it or something, Paulette? Yeah, that would be good. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, there's actually uh, two different uh, parts to this. One of them is, is uh, what we're looking for is to park two fully self-contained uh, and RMV registered RVs within the uh, Hundred feet of the median annual high water mark. Um, not five. He's uh, moved. Uh, proposes moving three of them out beyond the hundred foot mark. Um, and the installation of an engineer certified floating dock on the river. I'll uh, I'll address uh, mainly the RVs, and then if there's any other uh, questions for the dock portion, uh, maybe Mr. Britton uh, could step in at that point. I'm more versed on the uh, on the RV. Uh, aspect of this um so anyways okay he's been parking five rvs on his property every season since he purchased it i believe it was eight years ago um the site was prepared for rv use long before that since at least 86 um the land was altered back then uh, there's even uh there's a there's some graveled areas where rvs had been parked um so allowing for proper distance between our trailers um, there's enough room for Mr. Britton can park uh, three RVs beyond the 100 foot mark. So RVs that were, since he's been there for the past eight years, that were parked along the river, um, he's proposing moving them uh, outside beyond the 100 foot mark. Um, the remaining, so he's asking to, to, uh, to put two within the 100 foot mark. One of them be partially, so basically we're just calling it one, but it's a basically one and a half, but anyway, so it's, it's two RVs within or partially within the hundred foot zone. Um, anyway, like, like the, uh, like the document that we uh, was submitted last week, we get into some definitions of it, definitions of activities and altering, um, uh, altering land activities in the form of notice of intent means draining, dumping, dredging, damming, discharging, et cetera. Altering means to change the condition of any area subject to protection, like uh, changing pre-existing drainage, lowering of the water level, destruction of vegetation, uh, that kind of thing. Um, the RVs, like we discussed last time, the RV is basically just parking a uh, fully self-contained um, uh, uh, registry of motor vehicle registered um, uh, RV that can be moved at a moment's notice down the road. Uh, so where the only uh, impact really is parking it on the grass. Um, 
fully on board with the regulatory scheme that the, the town is uh, working up here for permitting. And uh, the first step in that actually is get, getting the okay from the Conservation Commission, which uh, um, Mr. Britton uh, is seeking to do here. Um, of course, there's no, there's no statute of limitations or anything, anything like that. But at any rate, just, it, there's, there was a permitting program that was never enforced. I just want to reiterate this. And uh, it's even been reported that over the years, people inquired about it. It seemed, it seemed that nobody really fully really knew much about it. Um, so it's understandable that an updated regulatory scheme needs to be implemented. No, I don't think anybody's uh, argued that. Um, what we're saying is just in, in all, in all, it's just another argument that goes to the grandfathering uh, aspect of this is that, you know, in all fairness, I mean, he bought the property uh, like eight years ago, he's been parking his RVs there, nobody has said a word, and now eight years down the road, um, uh, it's an issue. Again, willing to address it, but just looking for some fairness here. Um, let's see. So when we talk about... Um, so there are all the activities or references uh, in in the uh, in 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 the uh, EMR are mostly mostly more construction related activity. Um, so there's really no impact on the land or the water. Nothing's excavated. Nothing's changed. East RV has onboard propane, battery power, its own water supply, its own black water tanks, etc. Everything's brought in and taken out. Uh, the only footprint is uh, is mowing the grass around the RVs and tire tracks. Um, you know, some and some minor activities are exempt, uh, like mowing lawns. It's, it's, it's exempt. Um, let's see. Uh, the results in. definition of altering listed above talks about changes in drainage and salinity. He's not doing any of that. The area was altered. Uh, years ago, it was altered. I mean, it's a grassy area. Uh, there was some gravel placed uh, in some spots where, where trailers had been parked in the past, uh, but that was done years ago. Um, let's see. So anyway, so he's filing a notice of intent as a category one activity, uh, which is the least impactful activity. But even so, uh, those least impactful least impactful activities are still talking about construction construction of an addition on a house shed driveways uh site prep prep excavating um stuff of that nature again um which are all more impactful than than uh, parking the rvs uh let's see assumptions the authority presumes that the riverfront is significant to protect the following rebuttable enumerated interests and uh, gets into uh, a private or public water supply. Uh, the river is not utilized as a public water supply. Uh, providing flood control, there's no dike. The area regularly floods, preventing storm damage. Again, it's undeveloped, subject to flooding. Groundwater, there's no discharge of any chemicals or pollutants. Preventing pollution, uh, there's no sewage discharge other than what comes from the uh, sewage treatment facilities when, facilities when they get flooded, uh, which may flow onto the property, but that to do with the property itself. There's no land containing shellfish. Um, protecting habitat, um, Mr. Britton is, has not and doesn't propose to alter any of the surrounding area. Um, so where the, and even so, where the presumption is not overcome for argument purposes is that uh, the applicant needs to prove that there are no uh, practicable and substantially equivalent economic alternatives to the proposed project. Um, so again, Mr. Brittany, he just owns this one piece of property, he bought it for the purpose of putting RVs on it. Um, so there's no other substantially equivalent alternatives for the ma remaining two RVs. He's always parked five there. He, he's moving three. Moses is moving three, but he only has room for three beyond the uh, hundred foot uh, mark. And uh, okay, so his family I, and French went. Oh, I, I just want to interject a minute here. So when the riverfront or the riverfront areas and the regulations came into effect, that was 1996. So Correct. we go back and we look at what was on the site in 96. So Correct. in 96, there was one trailer, one camper. And so the additional campers 
anything within that hundred foot um, are considered alterations mm. and impacts on the riverfront area because that first hundred feet. So if he can do three campers outside of the hundred feet, it's not an economic hardship for him not to have two. And that's kind of the presumption or the alternatives analysis that we're really looking for. I, I understand. I understand that. But that's basically what we're asking. We're asking for two there historically, um, by looking at, I know you've had uh, aerial photos uh, that go back prior to, to 97, showed one. So it's been established that there was one there historically. Is that is that a fair assumption? There was one there, yes. Yeah. He's looking for another one. He's looking for one more. Um, that's, that's his proposal. Uh, again, that's up to the uh, the Conservation Commission, but that, that's what he's looking for. Yeah, technically he's looking for four more, three within the second hundred feet and an additional one within the first hundred feet. Correct. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. Bear with me a second. Again, like I said, of course, there's no statute of limitations. I mean, he's been allowed to do this for eight years, and um, we're just looking for some fairness. He's he's willing to move those three. Um, he has also proposed some uh, some uh, some mitigation uh, measures also. Um, what are you the, the mitigation? Do you, have, do you all have the map? New map. Can you address specifically what mitigation he's proposing? Uh, yeah. So, um, do you have the map there? Uh, for rep, so you can reference. He, he did a pretty detailed uh, diagram on that. Um, okay, so I can hang on. I can show you what I've got. Hang on. Um, now we receive. We just received this information today. Correct. So everything you're going through, we have not really had time to review it. Um. Or, and then the map, this is the map that we received. And we would have yeah, to go out it. and verify the 100 foot line because we know it's been staked, but where it's located and where potential campers are, I can't reconcile what's shown here versus what's out in the field looking at this map because it's not a surveyed plan where the line is. Paulette, you were out there though. Huh? You were out there, Paulette. Uh, I was out there in a pouring rainstorm, kind of looking over the fence because we were at other properties. I didn't have a tape. I didn't measure. I saw stakes and I didn't have a map there with me. So I would like to be out there on a day where there's no rain where we can actually walk on the property and do some measurements. We didn't access the property at all. Yeah, I mean, the offer, well, first of all, the offer was there, the offer's been there. I staked that out weeks ago. You can ask Janice about that. And Janice did say in her response that you guys had discussed the stake and it looked about right. Right, I mean, and, but where it is in the field versus what you're showing on the plan this plan isn't done by a surveyor, so I can't verify. There. We just got this plan today. Wow. So had I had this plan go. with the stakes out there, I could verify that, but I can't verify it. So what is this plan today? Well, it, it, and that's fine. That's fair. That's fair, but I mean, for talking purposes, anyways, it, it, even if you're not going to, um, you know, take this as an official map, that that's fine. But for talking purposes, it, it just helps me explain what what uh, uh, what I'm talking about. Yep. Okay, is that fair? Yep. Okay. So um, orig originally, those RVs were parked along the top or along the top of the bank. Um, as far as what. What yeah. Mr. Britt is proposing for okay. mitigation me. Uh, me. is- uh, Can somebody please mute themselves? There's people having conversations and 
we're having a hard time hearing what's being stated. Thank you. Mike? Go ahead. Okay. So no. you look down, down in the left-hand corner, um, there's a cross-hatched green area there. That, yep. That's an area... Yeah, that's an area that used to have an R RV park there. There's, there's gravel, it's all um, graveled area. Yeah, so, and the so Mr. For all the people that have already paid. That guy took that build now. Okay. Um, excuse me. Can it's people Mike. mute themselves? There's a lot of conversations going on, and we cannot hear. Okay. Thank so you. that cross hatched area, the green hot cross hatched area. Uh, that's where there, there's a graveled area there where there used to be our, an RV park there prior to Mr. Britt being there. What he's proposing is it's just a suggestion he'd be willing to um, just excavate some of that gravel out of there and replace it with topsoil and, and plant it with uh, native uh, vegetation. Uh, and also, um, there's he's proposing uh, planting, uh, there's a planting a tree, uh, probably about 25 feet. Uh, to the right of that, and then on the other end of the property line at the top of the bank, he's proposing uh, planting another native spe species tree. So he's talking about moving moving the RVs out of the area and then trying to restore that area somewhat, putting placing some trees and um, and some native vegetation in that area. So that that that's what he's um, and, and that's why this is good to, it's good to look at it, get an idea of what he's talking about. Um, that's what he's that's what he's uh, proposing for a mitigation uh, effort, um, everybody. So that's pretty much um, that pretty much sums up the mitigation efforts and pretty much where this proposal is. Again, um, he's asking he's asking that uh, he be able to be allowed to park two. Uh, RVs within the hundred foot uh, area. Um, uh, he has there's obvious. I mean, there's uh, there's aerial photos that document that there's at least one that was there prior to '97, and uh, right. he also has affidavits attesting to that. Um, right, and, but just so the understanding is, when you're looking at mitigation. It would be something that existed in 96. So if this gravel area wasn't existing in 96, that's what we just went through with the boys first. That's why we have to look back. If it wasn't existing prior and it was added after the river regulations came into play, it cannot be used as far as mitigation. We're assuming we're, we believe that it was that it was really old because he did not do it. He, okay, he did well, not we'll do it. we'll have to go out but again. These are it's a yep. suggestion. If if yep. that's something so these, that these are questions we'll have to address. Well, correct. So anyway, he'd be willing to do that as, as I guess yep. uh, where we're going with this. So um, we're gonna sure. we're gonna trade in two campers for one tree. That's what you're for basically proposing, right? Well, I don't know. We're trading well, nothing. Well, what we would need is um, we need to see alternatives analysis, what the alternatives analysis are. Um, we need to see the square footage of the campers, um, what at it, the exact square footage in the um, riverfront area is, and the mitigation is supposed to be one to one um, in riverfront based on the square footage. So that's, that is what we'd be looking for. Um, we'd also, if possible, yes, we would like to go out. I did look over the fence. I did see stakes there. Um, where the campers are gonna be located, um, those should be shown out on the property so that we can verify um, what is within and what is without um, out of the 100, uh, 100 foot and 200 foot area because we are asking people to put all campers outside of the 200 feet. Um, what is the argument for allowing anything within the first 100 feet? We know there was one. 
but there was what is one the argument was to up, allow right at the top of the riverbank? Correct. Paulette, I have a question. Yep. Um, do, does there need to be mitigation for the campers that are moved out of the 100 foot buffer? Uh, Janice, <laughs> uh, typically what we have been asking for because the 100, the first 100 feet um, have, that is considered the area that is, um, should remain pristine in that area. So we have been asking for mitigation in the first hundred, anything within the first hundred feet. That's why we've been asking people, we've been allowing people if they had campers outside of the first hundred feet and they moved any structures that were in that first hundred feet out of that, then they could do a request for determination. So that's the, that's the kind of thought on that. I think that answered. Is there anything else? I'm not sure. Janice, has the application been updated to show the proper owners with signatures? E yes, not with a signature, but um, did add the um, co-owner, Mr. Glamaldi, to the notice of intent and the um, waterways application. But has he agreed to this application with signature? Um, I have, we just got this stuff today, Gary, so I haven't had a chance to get back in touch. Um, so it's all the reason we have, we have 12 more hearings now. I know. Go on. We've already spent an hour and 15. We should continue this one then. Well, we, plain and simple, um, we will need to continue so that we can do a site visit here. Um, what I would like, uh, yes, you did have the 100 feet staked out. We need to verify that. Um, I tried to do a little bit from, you know, along the edge of the road. And we knew oh, that- had two weeks to do that. I, I left Janice a message two weeks ago to do that. Two weeks. And it has been a constant work day. But for the we, last two weeks because of all the permits that we've gotten. Right. We have received 12 additional permits coming in, including the whole reconstruction for Route yeah. So we, Janice is only part-time and we are all volunteers. We do not get paid for our time. We, I we spend, us, okay? just, just a point of order. Should Gary Pels here maybe recuse himself from anything with Mark Britton with a well, dot as an indirect competition? No. Are we, oh, if, wait a minute. Wait how are we do a competition? Okay. Okay. So if Mark Britton is running a marina and renting, that is not what is being put forth in this application. So if you are providing additional information to that, then you should speak up. Gary Pellissier he's, he's runs. Not, but if he has a dock, he's taking away money from docking at Gary's part. That is not. So there's a, uh, about 15 other dock permits and he is participating in those. What's the difference? Okay, well, well, the ethics commission will probably deal with that. Okay, well, and so we are looking, what we're looking at is we have an application for five campers. You have moved, you now have three outside of the 100 foot and you're asking for two. So what we need to do is we will go out and we'll schedule a site visit. And just so you know, the day that you saw me out there, um, that was about my fifth hour out in the pouring rain looking at site visits. So we did not go onto the property. We looked at it over a fence and you can't do proper measurements and verifications when you're looking over a fence. So we have been trying, I've been working full time. I'm going after work, going, trying to go out um, to certain site visits as I can. Oh, what else I'm saying is if you had just said when you were going out to Honeypot, when you're doing those other site visits and you're gonna stop by, a simple phone call would have had someone meet you there. Um, Rob, we didn't know that we were gonna swing by. We didn't realize how close it was to the other ones. 
and we said, oh, let's just yeah. swing over there. And we were actually on our way. We had another site visit after that. So we spent like five, 10 minutes at the site, if that. We had two more. On right, we had two more after that. So we did not, we didn't have the time to do it. So, so it sounds like there's, we need to do a site visit before we can make a decision about this. What yep. about the docks? Can we talk yeah, about that? Yeah, what about them? the dock? Yeah. Yep. All right. So you are. Um, you know, proposing... I'll let Mr. Mr. Britton uh, speak to the dock. Okay. Go ahead. Um, I'm just proposing to put nine boats on my docks. Uh, my dock is 580 square feet. There was question about um, tying off my docks to a dead stump. I am going to be putting a 66 inch helicoil galvanized anchor in the ground, which should not affect anything on the riverbank. Um, state law, Massachusetts state law says that you can have up to 10 boats on your docks. Your docks cannot be 600 square feet. Um, and as for the foot traffic, I have family members that have boats on my dock. They utilize my property. They come up, they um, spend time up there. It's our happy place. And that's not going to change the foot traffic by requesting nine boats. I myself have numerous boats at different times. I have a pontoon boat and a fishing boat. Sometimes I have a couple of row boats or skiffs. Um, what I'm proposing is um, well um, below the, the state guidelines. Okay, have you um, shown us where the helical anchor is gonna be attached on the shore? Yeah, it's on, it's on the map. It, it's gonna be right in front of the uh, previous um, anchor point, which was the dead stump. Okay. All right, and then, um, so you have stated that the docks that you have are, um, you've got them three by 20, three three by 20s, and five four by 20. Right. So that's there. All right. Um, okay, and I'm looking at- And I, I, you also requested me to have them Signed off by a professional engineer, which yep. um, I use the firm in Westfield Sage. They were, they uh, looked over the um, design of my docks and they stamped off the five or six pages that I submitted to conservation. Okay. And then now on your plan here, you are showing how, how you've got the helical anchor on the bank and then you've got a and I'm, I'm trying to read what it says because I can't read it. There's some. There are three. There are three. There are three Dan, Danforth anchors that um, attach to the river floor. Okay. All right. Um, and are those going to be in there permanent? No, they, they're taken out every year. I wouldn't risk for the cost of them uh, to lose them, so that I take them out every year. Okay. All right, and so one thing we want to make sure is that um, if the docks are approved, you can't, and when we've looked at aerials, because we've been looking at them up and down the river, um, over the years, you have had um, areas that, like an extension off of what would be A and E on your plans. There, yeah, there I, like I, I, I use those extensions in the past and, and I mean, I'm not going to make it up. I use them because it um, creates more stability. My father had a stroke and for him to get on the docks, it's difficult for him. So I, I use those little extensions. They're wider than the existing dock. I've used those for stability. Um, okay. I don't use, I don't use styrofoam as flotation. I use barrels, which they're round, so they're not as stable as styrofoam, but they're a little better for the environment. 
Okay, so understand that those are not being requested and those would not be permitted. Um, what you see on the map is what I'm going to be putting in. Okay. That's, I just want to put that out there. That's all. All right, That's fine. Um, commission members, are there any other questions? We know what the rule, the, the real rules are for how many docs you can have, or is that we just guessing? No, that's that's correct. Okay. Yep, that is correct. What's there? Well, right. I want further clarification from Mark Britton. Why he considers me a competitor? Well, um, I, um, Mark well, Britton did not say that. It was somebody else. So yeah. he wanted me to recuse myself as a competitor. Right. He said that. That was, that was um, another. That was not Mr. Britton saying that. That was somebody else who was saying that. That was so, said at a previous hearing too. I. I. Well, so, what it comes so, down to is this is not. Look, this is a yeah, uh, that is being put in or requested for personal use, not to be a business. Correct, Mr. Britton? That is correct. Okay, personal use not to be a business. Then they shouldn't be advertised on Facebook like the last time. Or correct. Craigslist. I've seen Craigslist, it. Craigslist, Facebook, they were all on there for rent or for renting years ago and they were taken off. He doesn't have 10 the people farms that want to stay for nothing. So the the people that the people that the people that use my docs are actually on the call right now. They're my close friends and my family. Okay. I do not make a profit off my docs. I do not make money and I'm not running a business. Okay. So where are you going to park all their cars? Okay. You only have um, a small lot. Gary, you, you actually saying this right now makes you in competition with him. No. Yes, it okay, does. Let's, He's let's... now saying his competition. Therefore, he needs to recuse himself. A hundred percent. No, no, no. Okay. First of all, he's not saying he's in competition. He just uh, did. If he's was, saying that Mark is renting stuff, he's now Hang in competition. On. Hang on. You are the person who mentioned that you thought Gary Pellisier was a competitor. I'm actually not. I'm just okay. listening. We, we are trying to clarify the issues here. Mm -hmm. That's why we are asking specific questions. I'm not sure. getting it for that. We've got about 10 more hearings to go. So we are looking at, I am asking commission members, is there any additional information you want so that we have the ability to go out there? Um, we will continue this till two more weeks, just like- Yeah, sure. I, I, I get that. Gary question. shouldn't be asking okay, if somebody on. is going to be yeah. renting their stuff. So this came up in the last to, okay, hearing. I am asking for commission members to speak only right now. <clears throat> this came up yes. in the last hearing. Um, the what I'm not sure about our sort of jurisdiction over this, but um, do we have jurisdiction or any? Should we be looking into? How many cars there are and like where they park? Is that the same thing? Yeah, I mean the cars should not be being parked within that first hundred feet, whether it's on a public road or not. So we can no. put that as a stipulation in the request for the situation. You could. Hmm? Okay. That's okay. up to the commission members. Hmm. Okay. All right. So Any other comments or questions from commission members? All right, so um, commission members, do you think we would have the ability to either next Tuesday or Wednesday to go out to this site after French Street? Name, name the day. Just well, we're saying know. Tuesday or Wednesday, we're trying to coordinate everyone. Wednesday would be better for me. Tuesdays okay. are a good day. Okay, does the commission wanna do one on Tuesday, one on Wednesday, French Street on Tuesday? Sure. And sure. Mr. Britton, is that are is someone available so that we can access the property? Yeah, I, I work nights, so that shouldn't be a problem. Um, can I ask you a question about the docs? Um, yeah. I'm I'm losing I'm losing, you know, my my 
ability to use my property um, this no, year not. already. No, you're not. You're not losing your ability to use your property. You One camper on that property allows you to use that property. There is nothing I'm, I'm, in, 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 that you in reference have. In, I wasn't talking about the campers in reference to the docks. Is okay. Can I put my docks in or can I get um no, you cannot put your docks in until you have a permit from DEP. All right. So can we move forward with the dock stuff tonight? No, because it's all under one notice of intent. We can't issue a permit for half and not the uh, the rest. Okay. Okay. Apologize for that, but because it's one notice of intent, we can't amend it. Um, what, uh, what time? What time is going to be the site visit on Wednesday? Do okay, we if yet? we do Wednesday, um, I can get up here for five o'clock. I know Jim, you said you can't, but Tony Lynn, you said you are available. Other way around, Jim can Other do Wednesday. Around. Okay, Jim, are you available on? Yeah, I can do Wednesday. Okay. What time? Um, what time, Jim? Five o'clock. Uh, uh, yeah, any any time. Uh, Wednesday the 19th, um, ridiculous. yeah. Five or 5.30? 5 4.30, 5, either okay. one. Five. I can get up here by five o'clock. Five o'clock, sounds good. Okay. Could we make a comment? Who? Um, hang on, okay. I yep. will, I'm, I'm, I'll ask for comments from the public for next. All right, so the commissions, we're gonna go out there five o'clock on Wednesday. All right. Um, okay. So it was Boysford on Tuesday then? Yes. Uh, okay, Mr. Gordon. Yes, I, I sold him the property and there was never any gravel. He placed the gravel there for the, for the RVs that he put there. There was no gravel on the property at all. Even previously, when the other camper was there, there was no gravel. Okay. And I have another <coughs> owner here, which is what I was to say, to answer Gary's question, no, I haven't agreed to anything. Second of all, I'll make sure I'm here next Wednesday at five o'clock. Yep. For the okay. site assessment. Yep. Okay. I yep. will be here next Wednesday. Yep. Okay. Okay. All right. Does the commission members have any other questions? Mr. Britton, do you have any other questions for us? I do not. Okay. Um, anybody else? in the public have a question directed to the commission regarding this particular project. Okay, so with that, I would ask for the board uh, for a continuance to 525 at um, 7 p.m. I move, move to continue to okay. second. All right, and we have a second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstain? Okay. Abstain. You're abstaining? Okay. All right. And Gordon's not here tonight. He's down in Connecticut. All right. So next item on our agenda is a notice of intent, public hearing 170280 for Mass. Department of Transportation, who seek to reconstruct and widen a section of Russell Street, which is known as Route 9, Middle Street to North and South Maple Street, including bicycle and pedestrian accommodations. Who is here for Route 9? Good evening, Madam. Okay. Sorry. This is uh, Sam Campbell from Green and Peterson, Inc. Okay. This is David Goldstein from Mastod Environmental. This is John Tamburini, uh, also from GP Greenman Peterson. And uh, Tim Dexter, Mass UT Wetlands and Wildlife Unit Supervisor. So I'm gonna lead it off and then kick it over to GPI for the presentation. Um, I wanted to uh, just uh, let folks know that the town and Mass DOT have been working very closely on this project and we appreciate that. Um, the town administration has helped us out, you know, greatly recently um, by agreeing to donate a couple of temporary easements um, to the project. So that has um, allowed us to access those um, properties for construction. 
Um, and it has allowed the state to save some money, which we appreciate. And it's also allowed us to avoid the eminent domain process on those parcels. Um, so, so it was a nice show of goodwill um, from the town. And as um, you may all know that mass duty is exempt from the butter notices. We're exempt from paying peer review fees and we're exempt from local bylaws, even though we strive to abide by them. Um, in particular on the matter of peer review fees, I know Janice reached out to mass DOT about paying for the fee. Um, and we understand it's a large project and that the commission has a high workload. So we've consulted with our legal counsel on this request and we've talked about um, the need for a timely review and decision by the commission in order to meet our project schedule. Um, you know, we talked about the, the show of goodwill from the town on the easements. So um, considering the whole situation, the, de the department is electing to waive our exemption from paying peer review fees for the project. Um, our legal counsel wanted me to be explicitly clear that in no way is this mass DOT renouncing our exemption from paying peer review fees, but this is instead a project specific um, uh, uh, waiver that, that we are applying um, to reciprocate the goodwill from the town. Um, so uh, one stipulation of the fee is that um, we must use a mass dot contract. If you'd like us to pay for it, we have a suite of on-call contracts. So we have a payment mechanism for the review. Um, and that will also allow a consultant team to get working on the review very quickly, um, which will benefit our project schedule. Okay, um, so our, I just have a question. So sure. you want us to use someone who's already in contract with you? So we have uh, these on-call environmental contracts, right? So, so there's a procurement process where um, there are firms that submit uh, uh, proposals to uh, get these contracts from MassDOT. And we have this suite of environmental on-call contracts where, um, so we've already gone through the pro procurement process and it's, and it's um, real easy to start an, an assignment with them um, without having to go through another procurement process. So, um, so we have a suite of firms that, have that we have existing contracts with. Um, and of those firms, we have six um, that have uh, wetlands experience, um, wildlife habitat assessment experience, and stormwater experience. Um, so, you know, we'd offer up any of those firms. You can choose, who, you know, uh, whichever firm you'd like to work with. Um, any particular context that you have with those firms, you could choose the, the particular people that you'd like to work on the review. Um, so, so that's up to you. Those firms are Jacobs, Stantec, uh, Tetratech, DHB, Weston and Sampson, and BSC. Um, we also have Epsilon. Can you oh, you sorry, go ahead. That list? Could you email that list to Janice, please? Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. yeah. We also have Epsilon on call, but um, I don't think they have the stormwater experience, and they also did the wildlife habitat assessment for this right. project. You do not want someone well, who has worked on this particular project. Yeah. That's kind of a, a big conflict. Yes, yes. So, um, so yeah. So you know, um, if if you'd like one of those firms to work on the project, you know, we'll gladly pay for it, and you can just work with them as you you know usually do. Um, you know, we just re request or hope that we can get them going quickly um, in order to facilitate the product schedule. So, um, you know, with that, I, I, I know you have a busy night, so I'll turn it over to G GPI to do the project schedule. And, and um, you know, I hope that to do the project presentation and GPI, I hope we can, um, you know, keep it kind of streamlined and, and to the point to facilitate a smooth uh, hearing. We know this will be continued. So... Yeah. We will probably, because we have to do a peer review, we would continue this to the June meeting, not in two weeks, because it would almost be impossible to have a peer review done and back to us within two weeks. And sure, we, we were hoping that we could um, perhaps schedule a site visit um, mm -hmm. between now and in the next hearing. Um, yep. And, um, you know, and we'd like to get that peer review started quickly so that um, you know, you can have some fun by the next hearing. Yep. I'm, I'm still trying to get the um, plans and materials put up on the town website so that um, a, a butters interested people, even the commissioners, I can't send them those plans. So there's what, 32 kilobytes, um, megabytes or something. So I'm trying to find a way to get that information to them um, as well. So we need a little more time to be able to get that 
information out to people. But thank so, you for the offer on the review. Yeah, and I understand that um, I have been given access to the plans um, through GPI to log in to be able to look at them online. Um, is it possible so that if we have other commission members who are interested in looking at the plans online that we would be able to give them a temporary password to be able to go in and look at the plans? Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, so typically when we send those links, there is an option to download a copy of the PDF. So if you or Janice is able to do that and then share it among the commissioners, that could be one option. Um, if not, after this hearing, if Janice, you could provide me with the email addresses of each member of the commission, I would be happy to send an electronic copy of all the materials that we submitted to you um, to each member individually as well. All right, that would be good because trying to send that size um, email is, is too big. <laughs> yep, absolutely understand. And you know, if we can do anything else to help, I mean, I can pull out selected sheets that show environmental impacts or even send um, half size hard copies to your office um, so that okay. they can pick them up for review. Just let me know however you want to proceed and we can, we can absolutely do that. Thank you. All right, um, please proceed. Great. So yeah, I'm just going to pass it to John Tamburini. He's the project manager at GPI. Very brief overview of the project limits and major improvements. And then I will do a brief summary of the environmental and wetland impacts and concerns. Sounds good. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm John Tamburini. Um, do I have ability to share my screen? I believe you do. Um, can everyone see that? Yep. All right. All right. Um, so quick brief overview of the project. So this is the project area. Um, as you can see here in red, it uh, is the Route 9 corridor from the Middle Street intersection to just east of the North-South Maple Street intersection. Uh, the project will also include work on East Street as well as other intersecting side streets along the corridor. Um, and it'll also approximately um, include about a half a mile's worth of work uh, on both North and South Maple Street, uh, which brings the total project length to approximately three and a quarter miles long. Um, so some of, some of the some of our goals we look to achieve with this project uh, included improving safety and increase accessibility for pedestrians and bicyclists by providing eight foot mm -hmm. shaded paths on both sides of the roadway for most of the Route 9 corridor, um, ADA compliant cement concrete sidewalks and pedestrian curb ramps where we end up transitioning to and from the shared use paths as well as five feet, five foot on street dedicated bicycle lanes in the sections that <laughs> not include a shared use path. Um, all these signalized intersections, they will now include crosswalks with timed crossings and dedicated bicycle accommodations. Um, we also look to improve the safety and increase vehicle capacity at the intersections, um, improving, we want to improve stop accommodations and efficiency by providing dedicated bus pull-offs, and upgrading accommodations with new bus shelters throughout the corridor, um, reduced the congestion and traffic delays by adding a two-way left turn lane down the center of Route 9, um, promote connectivity and walkability throughout the Route 9 corridor but by providing new access points to the Nowatic Rail Trail, um, we're incorporating streetscape elements such as landscaping and street trees. Uh, we'll be improving the drainage and upgrading utilities. Um, and all, you know, in the end, we wanted to accommodate and be sensitive to abutters, the existing vegetation, and um, the historic resources that are out there. Um, so this. Uh, here. 
this is just a, an aerial view of what the typical section along the Route 9 corridor will end up being pretty much between Meadow Street and just west of the Home Depot driveway. Um, and it, it includes one travel lane in each direction uh, with a two-way, with a 13-foot two-way left turn lane down the center of the roadway. There'll be a two-foot shoulder on each side of the roadway. Granite curbing will be installed along with six and a half foot grass strips separating the eight foot shared use paths from the roadway. Um, this will be just a typical, this is just a typical rendering of what it will end up looking like. Uh, the next portion is, um, so that, that, that typical section goes to about, like I said, just west of the Home Depot driveway. From the Home Depot driveway to the end of the project limits, it's pretty much um, it pretty much the same as, as it exists out there today. Uh, the only differences really is that we added in five foot bicycle lanes. Um, as well as two bus pull-offs on either side of North, South Maple, North and South Maple Street. Um, we also added in uh, concrete sidewalks on, to both sides of the roadways, um, you know, pedestrian curb ramps and crosswalks as well. Um, on South Maple Street, that is somewhat of what it exists today as well in terms of the two-way left turn lane down the center of the roadway. Um, but, you know, it's pretty similar to what's being proposed on Route 9. Uh, the only, the big differences are instead of a two-foot shoulders, we're providing five-foot bicycle lanes and cement concrete sidewalks on both sides instead of the shared use paths. Um, that's pretty much just a, a brief overview of the project in and itself. Um, where we stand in terms of schedule, uh, the, the final design has been submitted to MassDOT about three weeks ago. Um, it, it's current, it's being, the project is being advertised for construction September 11th of this year. Um, you know, really we're in the final steps. Um, you know, the final steps are pretty much just the permitting. Uh, we do have quite a few permits um, secured already, including uh, the MEPR certificate, the um, DCR permit, uh, because we do have some work being done on DCR land. Um, but that's pretty much where we stand and where you know what the what the project entails. Um, I think I can pass it on to Sam. Uh, okay, to hang on. Um, Steve, you have a question. You have a hand raised. I didn't, but I just. I mean, you got to have the same amount of bike paths as you are roads. You got a three lane road, or you got three lanes of bike paths. It yeah. just seems like an overkill. You know what I mean? And I lived in Halley all my life. Yeah, I mean, when you looked at the, that was kind of one of the things that struck me. When you look at the section of Route 9 that you're working on, you actually um, cross over the bike path that's there in order that was constructed to keep people off of Route 9. Right. So that's, it's, it's a little funny that you're encouraging people to be on Route 9 when we the bike path was constructed to keep people off of Route 9. And then we have the age old question of who's going to maintain those areas and the sidewalks. I mean, you can see the yellow right there, Route 9 bisects it. Um, okay. And people use the bike path. Um, I could see sidewalks, yes, but pedestrian lanes, I think that's unnecessary. Um, Again, and it kind of, you know, sticks in my craw that you're here presenting to us to get a permit and you're saying, oh, well, we're already ready to go out to bid, but you haven't obtained the permit from us. 
yet you're ready to advertise and go out to bid on a project that doesn't have a permit yet. So, and I'm curious, couple things. One, did you address the concerns or comments that we put when we um, reviewed this plan, Janice put together with working, I worked with Janice, put together a number of um, comments. I would like to see what, how you address those. I'd also like to see where there are particular um, wetland impacts because the MEPA just uh, breezing over that. Um, we did not even get a copy of the comments from MEPA. We had to get them from DEP who sent them to us. So it's, it's kind of, you're, you're off on a bad foot right now. Um, so can you please address wetland impacts? Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, so first, uh, apologies if there was some mix up with the response to the MEPA comments. I know we did prepare a comment response letter both to the comments that the commission provided as well as DEP's comments and those were sent out prior to the issuance of the MEPA certificate and we can absolutely provide you with um, an additional copy of that letter. Um, I believe that we addressed all of those concerns. Hey, and, Janice, um, did you get a copy of that at all? I don't remember seeing it. I, I do. I, I, I didn't agree with um, the way some of our uh, questions were addressed, but we did get that, but we didn't get the MEPA certificate okay. with the, the final comments from the secretary. That was, that was strange. Okay, um, we have a copy of that that we can share with you as well. Um, I'll send it. But that's okay, thank you. Okay. Um, all right, yeah, so I mean, just to speak to some of the environmental factors on this project. Um, resource areas on the site were delineated in the field by professional wetland scientists in 2016, and locations and boundaries were redelineated and confirmed in October of 2019. Uh, wetland resource areas within and adjacent to the project limits include bordering vegetated wetlands, isolated vegetated wetlands, banked to intermittent and perennial streams, land underwater, riverfront area associated with four unnamed perennial streams, as well as the 100-foot buffer zone to bank and BBW. Uh, on the plans that were submitted with this notice of intent, which I can pull up uh, some of those now. Are you able to see my screen? Yep. Yep. Um, so again, these plans that it sounds like you have the two copies that we sent, but we'll be sending additional for all the other members of the commission to review. The limits of bank and BVW are indicated by the blue points and dashed lines. The limit of riverfront area is indicated by the pink dashed lines. And the limit of the 100 foot buffer zone is indicated by the red dashed lines. As you can see in the legend here, we also have a variety of color hatches and line work to indicate proposed wetland resource area impacts. Um, and the impacts on each sheet are summarized in the resource area legend. Um, as far as impacts go, the project will result in impacts to bordering vegetated wetlands totaling uh, temporary impacts 3,115 square feet, permanent 3,514. Um, those impacts are a result of you know, the linear nature of the project and the presence of those resources adjacent. We are proposing some widening of the roadway as well as the construction of pedestrian and bicycle paths. Um, we also have impacts to bank, land underwater, and riverfront area. Uh, and those impacts are summarized apologies, on the plans, as I mentioned, um, kind of sheet by sheet, you can see the different areas, they're all in color. They're also on the notice of intent form as well as the narrative. And again, um, to aid in your review, we'll be sending copies of those to all of the commissioners so that everyone can, can go through individually. Thank you. Yeah. So to mitigate for those proposed impacts, uh, we will be constructing three wetland replication areas totaling 3,826 square feet, and all of the temporarily impacted areas will be restored in place for a total replacement of 6,941 square feet, which is actually in excess of the total combined temporary and permanent alteration. 
Uh, we're also proposing mitigation through the control of invasive species on site. Um, control of invasives will be done through selective mowing, clearing and grubbing, and the application of herbicides where necessary. And all of that will be done through an invasive species management plan uh, that is conducted you know, in accordance with the standard procedures from MassDOT landscape and, and done by an approved contractor. Um, the project also proposes to plant 169 new trees along the corridor and will armor or otherwise protect the existing trees within the project limits that are close to the limit of work, um, such as grading, you know, just to ensure that there's no damage to the trees or the root systems during construction activities. As far as stormwater goes, uh, the construction phase, you know, will have erosion and sedimentation control measures generally consisting of compost filter tubes or, um, you know, an, an improved alternative. In some cases, silt fencing will be used. Uh, the project also proposes to install 260 new deep sump catch basins, which will allow for the settlement of suspended solids prior to discharge. Um, the project is also going to relocate two existing outfalls and provide stone pads for velocity dissipation um, and provide a bit of a setback from the existing wetlands so that they're not, you know, discharging directly to wetland resource areas. Um, within the grass buffers between the proposed roadway and the shared use path, we'll be installing tree box filters as well as shallow vegetated swales and the proposed shared use paths will be pitched in a manner so that the runoff from those paths is going directly to those vegetated areas and being given a chance to infiltrate a bit prior to, um, or rather than I should say, being discharged directly via the existing outfall points. Um, as I mentioned in an email, you know, we'll provide additional copies of all this material to you. We can also provide the MEPA response letter as well as the comment response letter that we prepared uh, based on the comments that were provided by MassDEP Western Region last week. Um, so I know, you know this is obviously a very large project and it's um, relatively complex. So I don't wanna necessarily just talk at you the whole night. So I think I'll wrap it up at this point and, and maybe turn it over to any preliminary questions that the commission may have. So I have just, um, I'm looking at the plan that you have there right now, the intersection Mill Valley Road where the bike path goes underneath. Is there a reason why you feel you need to have bike paths on Route 9 when there is a, a rail trail right there? Instead um, of making connections to the rail trail, why you need additional uh, lanes on either side? So we are proposing to provide new connections to the bicycle path, the Norwatica Trail. Um, and I believe that the intention of the paths along Route 9 is to kind of accommodate those users who wish to access all of the various, you know, residential and commercial areas along Route 9, um, but can't necessarily do that in the existing condition because they're not comfortable with the accommodations that are provided. Um, you know, sometimes that on-street bicycle accommodation isn't the most welcoming to folks. And, um, you know, there are, as you mentioned, in the existing condition, not many connections to the Norwatica Trail. So people that are trying to access sort of those businesses in between or those residences in between have to overshoot in one direction and then come back along Route 9. Um, John, I, I don't know if you want to speak to this a bit more. I know you probably have worked pretty closely with the town and MassDOT on selecting the design for the roadway. Yeah, no, I mean, you, you, you hit the nail on the head, Sam. Um, so we are providing an access point throughout the corridor um, to the Norwalk Rail Trail. Um, so if you go back to the screen right before that, that you had it on, yeah. So that, that's one of them um, just above Mill Valley Road. Can you scroll kind of up and... Um, right there. Yeah, we can we can see it. Yeah, yeah. So that that that's one of the access points, and and on the other side of the tunnel, there's there's also another access point, um, and there's another access point that we will be put that is being provided on South Maple Street as well. Um, so, so can I can I ask, in lieu of doing all of this? why was it not looked at to put two lanes of traffic versus what is respectfully called a suicide lane in the middle? 
So this has been vetted, um, multi that was looked at. Um, so this had been, this, the project history in a sense has been going on for probably like six, seven years now. Um, and, yeah. you know, in, in talks with Mass DO, between Mass DOT, the town, um, this is the typical section that actually uh, came out to be the most um, recommended and uh, the most, that, that's going to provide the most safety, um, you know, by having one lane in each direction and then the two-way left turn lane because there's so many different businesses and um, residents along this corridor <clears throat> provides a safer access for vehicles to enter that lane while, uh, by, while others can maintain the flow of traffic and, and re really reducing congestion throughout the whole Route 9 corridor because there's a lot that exists out there today. Okay, and I will ask the question that I've been asking and the Conservation Commission has been asking. Now you are putting in two travel lanes, pedestrian slash bicycle travel lanes, eight feet, one on each side. Are you gonna plow those in the winter to provide access to people? Thank you. So this has been brought up. Um, we've had plenty, we've had a lot of discussions with the town on this. Uh, so. Yes or no, it's an easy answer. It's a little bit more than that. Um, so right now. It's yes or no. During, during construction, the contractor is responsible he will, they will plow all the sidewalks and shared use paths throughout the project limits during construction. Right. After construction is when the issue comes up. And that's what I'm asking. After construction, is Mass Highway going to maintain and or plow and keep open these pathways? That's a yes or no question. I agree. Yes or no? Yeah. Oh, so you build it. You're going to take care of it. You're not going to give it to us. You're not. It's not. It's not that simple because this. this it is that simple. Yes or no? This project is a good question. Will not be constructed for probably another four or five. Won't finish construction probably for another four or five years. Yes or no? At That's that time. Great. At that time. MassDOT is trying to implement a, in, in the meantime, MassDOT is trying to implement a program where they can plow and maintain these sidewalks and shared use paths throughout the projects, throughout the right. state. So, so there, there is year round maintenance, um, where there, MassDOT has a comp comprehensive process for inventorying the condition of curb to curb roadway pavement and for clearing snow and ice on all roadways and bridges traveled by right. vehicle. And this I'm, I'm going to stop you there because Mass Highway has what I call a black pavement policy. It's got to be black pavement. You're not going to put, stop at putting chemicals down. You're not going to stop at putting salt down. When, when and if you decide to plow this, just looking at this stretch right here on the north side of the road, you are adjacent to a wetland. So if Mass Highway goes in there and plows that area, that any type of chemicals and everything else that you put onto the roads or those pathways are going to end up in the wetland. So this is where we need you to address these issues because once it's constructed four or five years down the road, you guys may not be here, okay? You may not be the person we're talking to and someone else is gonna say, not my problem, we didn't do it. It's yours, it's in the town, you're responsible for it. 
And I'm looking at what the issue and what the impacts in the future are going to be on the wetlands there. So those are the things that we are going to be looking to be to have addressed in writing that's enforceable. Okay, just I'm I'm just putting it out there because this has been an age old issue. You and you created a sidewalk um, further down by the Marriott in that area, and now the snow gets pushed into the wetland. The trash goes into the wetland. Mass Highway is not going along cleaning out the trash that comes from the road into the wetland. So these are all issues that we are going to want to have addressed. I'm just going to put that out there, please. Yep, we completely okay. understand that. And I know that the question of uh, winter road maintenance and winter shared use path maintenance was also raised during the uh, MEPA review process. As I mentioned, we'll provide a, a response letter or the response letter that we prepared. And we can also provide um, some additional information on MassDOT snow and ice management policy. Uh, I know they've made a significant effort in recent years to um, really track when where and why they're applying uh, roadway sand and that they have significantly reduced, if not eliminated the use of salt. Um, but I think, again, I, I don't wanna speak up. If they've elim almost eliminated salt, how are they keeping the highways clear when all the side streets are not? It's not I, just plowing. There's something is being put down, either pre-treatment is being put down on the roads um, I see it on the highway 91. I drive it every day. I see it on route nine. I drive it every day. I drove it over the winter. I drove it last winter. So those are the things that we, I'm going to want to see from my, from my own perspective. Absolutely. And I don't want to speak out of my depth here. So I will wait until I can provide you with the actual Thank document, you. but I, I know that there's, um, it's something that they've certainly been evaluating and they're, they're required to, um, you know, summarize in their annual or biannual reports. Yeah, Paula, we'll, we'll get you a, a full write-up on all the operational DMPs we've been implementing over the years. Made huge improvements over the amount of salt that we put down um, through those DMPs. So we'll get you a full write-up on that. And we're happy to answer any, any of those questions after you have a chance to review it. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a question. Um, thanks for this information. And as Paula said, we're a little, um, you know, it's coming in feeling like we're already our, have our guard up because we've been talking about this project as the Conservation Commission for, I don't know, a year and a half or something saying, oh. when is the state gonna come talk to us? And and any kind of indication that there's a hurry will we'll, we'll kind of fall on deaf ears because we felt like we've been wanting to hear from all of you. Um, the, and I do like in, in terms of the de-icing, for example, and, and, and Paulette, you do have a written document where they have all their responses that Janice mentioned, but you know, it says like, it won't necessarily, this widening won't necessarily increase the de-icing treatments, which either goes to the point of that the pedestrian way won't be, um, you know, plowed and de-iced or that that doesn't, like, it just seems really surprising about how there could be not extra de-icing because it um, seems like, of course, there will be more pavement. Especially um, if it's pedestrian or and or bicycles in there. And I do want to make the point, so I actually bike my commute. <laughs> so I have come down on a different side of this. I've tried to bike along Route 9 and I, like, I love uh, uh, the Norwatic trail it's wonderful but it doesn't go to places you need to go for work or to go grocery shopping or whatever so I understand adding lanes will get more people on bikes and fewer people in cars I think that's great um a lot of the that uh rail trail is wonderful to get from Amherst to Northampton in the summer <laughs> or the spring or the fall but it doesn't get cleared in winter so you suddenly can't bike your commute anymore already so adding another pedestrian way or another bike lane where you can't bike your commute because it's not being plowed is, um, you know, we haven't solved the first problem, which is we already have this wonderful commuter path, path between Amherst and Northampton that you can only use for three seasons. Um, so I really appreciate Paula bringing up that, that point. Um, I uh, stood with um, Janice and Paula uh, maybe two years ago and looked into the 
stuffed culvert underneath Route 9 um, and wondered about when DOT was going to figure out how to clear the culvert and get some passage of wildlife um, so that we could have better passage underneath the, um, the road. And even then we were like, well, they're, they're not going to do it because they're, we had heard they're going to be eventually redoing Route 9. Um, I was really disappointed that the four culverts are not going to be replaced, just extended. And um, Tim, as you know, we uh, have a great resources um, locally from UMass thinking, looking at how we should be replacing our culverts and prioritization around those. I haven't looked at the four culverts to see if they are culverts that should be prioritized for replacing, but it's certainly cheaper to do it when you're taking up the whole road then when you have to come back and do them one by one, as we have, as we know, um, because you know, all across Massachusetts, we can't get culverts replaced half or a tenth or a hundredth as fast as we need to, given climate change and um, you know maybe bad practices in the past. So I think it'd also be good to see the analysis of how the culverts would do going into the future with increased. Uh, heavy rain events and um, you know, the improved science on passage to make sure that they're actually good enough to going into the future and not just that they don't need to be replaced now according to what is happening with the road. So we're just gonna ignore them. Tim, I think those comments were directed to you. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Tony. Yeah. We'll, we'll look into all that with the design team. Uh -huh. Back to you. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Other commission members. Yeah. We're going to, so we will need the list of the consultants that are on your list there so we can review and approve or hopefully select somebody to do the review. Um, we've talked about Again, we want from you uh, information about your storm management, not only um, culvert cleanings, um, also with uh, culvert replacements versus just extensions. Um, we are looking at the management of these pedestrian slash bicycle lanes. Um, are they gonna be open four seasons or just three seasons? And is it, you know, cost effective to have them on both sides of the road? So those are the things that we're gonna look at. And then the impacts on the wetlands, not only during construction, but post-construction um, with stormwater, trash, um, plowing, snow removal, everything like that along those areas. And then impact on wildlife, because there's quite a big area, um, wildlife area, um, that we actually have been, you know, interested in or looking at the area up behind um, Cross from Mountain Farms Mall. And there are other various, one of the places, Tony Lynn and I and Janice, we we're all standing there, um, is further down. And that area actually had animal prints in the sand and the sediment, go, trying to get underneath Route 9. So that is why we brought up, so this was probably back in 2016 when you had flagged them and then we, uh, you mentioned we approved the wetland line in 2019. I think we were out there a little earlier than that, looking at that. So these comments were brought up then. Um, so these are all things that we want you to look at. And I appreciate the fact that you want to go out to bid. But these conversations probably should have been had a year or two years ago with the Conservation Commission prior to giving us a plan that you're telling us is going to go out to bid in, you know, a couple months. That's, okay. we completely understand that. And our intention wasn't to, to try to, to rush you here. It's just, you know, we can only um, calculate the impacts once the design has been finalized. So, you know, unfortunately trying to, to keep up with that, um, we now have a final design and we're 
presenting it here and we understand your, your concerns and we look forward to continue to work through all this with you. Okay. Does any commission members have any other questions or comments? I just got one. Um, if you guys do decide to advertise that you're gonna plow the bike path, if somebody gets hurt on it, who's responsible? Because you know it's gonna it's gonna melt, it's gonna freeze, and somebody's gonna ride their bike, and Marquis Solomon's gonna be right around the corner. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. I, and I believe any other I believe everybody's been answering my questions. The questions that I want answered are, have already been stated, so <laughs> I restate them. Okay. And are there any questions or um, comments from the public? that you would like to see addressed. Um, we will be continuing this because it is a huge project um, and we will be getting a peer review, um, which means the peer review actually means we are hiring a consultant who works with the commission to review the plans and information um, for this permitting. Okay, anybody from the applicant want to say anything in closing? Um, yeah, so yeah. apologies. Um, I understand that, you know, it's going to take some time to get the peer review uh, rolling and certainly to get it completed. I am wondering if maybe it's worth it if we could request to be on the agenda for your next meeting, which it sounds like is in two weeks, um, just because if we send, you know, application materials to all the individual commissioners and any um, other questions come up in the interim, we can sort of respond to them as they arise. Not in two weeks. Uh, I, I really don't see this uh, having a peer review or even having questions or comments. I mean, as questions or comments from commission members comes up, we will funnel them to Janice and we will work with, hopefully within two weeks, we have somebody that the commission finds acceptable on your list um, in order to expedite um, this process, but we will funnel our comments through Janice and or the consultant. Okay. And um, I guess our other question was just, we're very flexible. You know, we have several members of our project team working on this, but if there is um, a site visit or if we could schedule a site visit, we would um, you know, like to be out there whenever you folks are available. Yep, that uh, because it's Route 9, it would probably have to be, and because of the extent of it, I'm thinking like on a Saturday um, to go out there and, and be able to look at certain areas because it will take a while. Yes, and there are definitely, you know, we kind of know the hot spots, the key areas that are best for probably all of us to look at. Um, okay. So rather than walking the full mm -hmm. three miles, we can kind of jump around. All right, so I need a motion from the commission to continue this. What is the date of our June meeting? Everybody have that second Tuesday? Eighth. June, June 8th. Uh, I move we continue this, this DOT uh, meeting. Okay, Route 9 and Notice of Intent to June 8th. Tony Lynn, second. Okay, yeah. we have a second. Um, we'll put it at seven o'clock. Do we have any other questions, comments by commission members? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <clears throat> any abstentions? All right, we'll see you guys. Well, we'll probably see you before then because maybe we can get a site visit scheduled prior to June. Right. Excellent. Yeah. And thank you for the opportunity to present tonight. If you have any questions in the interim, please don't hesitate to reach out. Okay. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. gentlemen. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. All right. So our next um, hearing is request for determined or public <clears throat> meeting request for determination of applicability for R. Riley and C. Norton to seek to install a seasonal floating dock along the Connecticut River at 66 River Drive. Who is here for the applicants? Paulette, sorry, before you yep. start this, can, can I make a suggestion that since we're going to can try to deal with the other items on this agenda at the next meeting that we decide what we think we can get through 
like before 10 o'clock, call the meeting. And I mean, Janice, you guys have a sense in, in the pre work you sent, it seemed like there were some that didn't have plans that were gonna be continued. So we can let people go instead <clears> of waiting here until we decide that we can't take it anymore. So I would suggest that we decide what we can do between now and 10 and try to accomplish that and then push the rest of it off to the next meeting. I, I agree I, with you, Jim. Yeah, I think what we have is there's a number of, uh, of these applications that we can kind of go more quickly because some of them may be um, continued. So we will try and get through these much quicker. Those were the notice of intents. Um, so those were a lot tougher. Okay, 66 River Drive. Uh, hi, I'm Valerie Miller with SWCA Environmental Consultants, and I'm representing uh, Rita Riley and Carol Norton on their proposed uh, seasonal dock. So as you stated, they live at 66 uh, River Drive, and they are interested in installing the seasonal dock. They have an, some existing wooden stairs and platforms at their property that go down to the Connecticut River. Uh, they'd like to attach the seasonal dock to the end of the stairway that is right down at the waterway and just use it um, for the summer months. So we're in the process of submitting a chapter 91 permit to DEP. And as part of that process, we're submitting, submitting this request for determination um, that we hope will be a negative determination at the outcome of this. Um, so the process, um, we went forth and we did the RDA. We went, um, wetland scientists from SWCA went out to the site um, and flagged the mean annual high water on the bank at their property. And we have submitted a map um, that was just prepared also by Berkshire Design Group. So Berkshire Design surveyed it out in the field and the back of their property and then picked up our flag lines to show the mean annual high water and the top of the slope where their house is and then down to the water edge. And so we've submitted a, a figure that illustrates um, this mean annual high, which is at about an elevation of 114 feet in elevation. And so that's pretty much where one of their, their platforms is on one of the, on the top of the bank or I'm sorry, at the mean annual high. <laughs> so okay. um, can I just, <clears throat> I, I just wanna try and keep moving things on. We, my understanding is that the original plan that was submitted is not the one that the applicants wanted and we needed to have, Janice, am I remembering this correctly? We needed a revised plan? Yes. Did we get a revised plan in? Yeah, we submitted that this afternoon to you, Janice. Okay. Yeah. And so, did, did the property owners look at it and they said that it's correct this time? I haven't yeah, heard back. Yeah, they're both on the, the call right now, Rita and Carol. Um, and they I talked it over with them too. And they understand the dock was originally illustrated as a T. It's really an L-shaped dock almost. So we refigured that. The dock, the designers had added um, like, float, I mean, uh, like bricks or, or uh, something to tie the, the dock to the bottom of the, of the of Connecticut River and that's not gonna happen. It's just a floating dock with a hinge. So that was fixed. The mean annual high was moved and correctly illustrated and stated as the 114 line. And we submitted all of that to Janice. So everything should be good to go with that. Okay, but we, Janice has not had time to review the plan and the commission members have not seen it either. Nope. So what I am going to suggest um, is again, and sorry to do this, but that we would have to continue this for two weeks so that we have the ability to actually give it a proper review that that I guess that's that's up to you. Yep, Janice and I walked the site um, yesterday morning too, and we we confirmed these these locations and we updated the plan. So if Janice 
wants to wait two weeks or if she can speak to that. I don't know how the commission feels. Well, I didn't, I didn't get a chance to look at the plan and I was waiting to hear back to see if Rita and Carol said it was correct this time or not. And I've been working all day preparing to get everything ready for the meeting tonight. So, and the commit, so I did not send it on to the commission because I didn't hear back about whether they had said it was correct. So that's, I think it's better to, to just wait the two weeks and make sure that we've um, all had a chance to look at it. But what I saw in the field was fine, um, but it was just that the plan that had been submitted didn't seem to, to match the conditions. So it was, we revised, but since I, like I said, I didn't hear back saying that they had approved it. So I didn't send it on to the commissioners. All right. So as the commission members have not seen the plan, I haven't seen it. Janice just got it today. Um, I don't feel comfortable closing this um, and voting on this. No. Nope. And I will hear from, okay, Edwin, you said no. Other commission members? Uh, I just want, yeah, uh, I just, how many votes you got? One, one vote? It's uh, fine. It doesn't, I mean. This for one <laughs> vote? Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't feel comfortable not having seen the plan. I saw the old plans, but I haven't seen the new ones. Okay, so I, I was just gonna suggest I'd make a motion to continue. I'm really sorry yep. um, to the three of you that uh, you had to wait, but I hope you'll understand that since we just got the document five hours ago and we haven't seen it yet, that we have to continue in two weeks. And if it makes you feel better, we're doing four times the normal, our normal volunteering job these days um, so that people don't have to wait too long. So sorry for that. Um, it's so only a couple hours. Me. <laughs> yeah i mean we understand yeah i will be back in two weeks janice has the plan i'll stay in touch with janice the homeowners are okay with everything that we've submitted to date so as long as you guys have time to look at it um yeah, we'll definitely hopefully we'll close it next week <laughs> or we the next put them week. on the top of the list right yep that would be okay. sweet. <laughs> All right, so we need a request for determination um con uh to continue this Right, I move to continue until May 25th. We'll put it May at 25th. Second. Second it. Yep. All right. Uh, yep. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Uh, Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Aye. Thank you. Um, sorry. Thanks. Sorry. I think I was, uh, I also just want to say, I think I was on the list later, Janice, for the next AMP property, and you yeah. were going to continue that one as well, yeah. so. Okay, so why don't we just do that one? Yeah. So I'm, okay. <laughs> okay. So we have the, that's the, yeah. that's the Hadley three? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, that is the last item on the agenda request for information, <laughs> which is the next AMP, next AMP. Um, we need that to be continued. So yes. can I have a motion to continue that to? So move. Wait a minute. Second. Motion. Do I have a second? Which, which date are you going to do, Paulette? To, um, mm -hmm. Well, we were looking for, will you have information to us? Um, not on the day of the meeting, because if it's on the day of the meeting, we will continue it. They have told me they will have everything way before two weeks, but... Yes. You know. <laughs> All right. So we will we will do it for two weeks. Thank you. Um, May twenty fifth, and if something comes up, we will put it at the top of the meeting and continue it then. Okay. Yeah. Thanks very much, everyone. Okay. Do I have a motion? I have a second. Do I have any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Um. Who? I'm sorry. Who did? Who did the motion and seconding for this one? Edwin, I'll I second. Him. Yeah, Edwin and Steve. Okay, thanks. Thank you. All right. So next is um, request for determination of applicability. Public meeting. I rule seeks to install a seasonal floating dock along the Connecticut River at 99 Aquavita Road. Hi there. Hi. Hi. Um. So, um, yes, at 99 Aquavita Road, um, I will just say right off the bat that 
when I was a kid and when my kids were kids, we used to go out at the end of that property, which was my dad's farmland where I picked asparagus when I was young and we would play on the sandbars over there. But as of last year, certainly when we were driving our pontoon boat up and down the river, we saw, we see clearly that there's no longer any sand um, bars in front of our property. So we drove the pontoon boat up to it, just about to the land and said, hey, why don't we just put a dock here and put our pontoon boat and our jet ski there? So that's what started this. Um, and I had no idea at the time that this was gonna be the year when everyone had to do these permits. So it's been <laughs> um, kind of crazy. But um, so I did submit um, plans to the DEP but I need, I know that they require a um, engineer stamp and we're not able to get the engineer stamp until the water recedes enough that an engineer could go out there and measure the water level. Because I know that people have had um, questions about is, is the water deep enough there for a dock? Um, currently, we have submitted the plan to the Conservation Commission um, I, I revised the plan and I just sent that out, I think yesterday morning. So I don't know if you all have been able to receive that yet. No, no. I see that. I don't know if I saw it. I'm trying to remember a revised plan. Oh yes, you put in the um, helical anchors or something on it, right? Correct, yes. Okay. Otherwise, yes, it's pretty much the same. Um, um, Paulette and uh, Janice came out and did a site visit um, last week and you know, showed me some things about the lot and what I needed to um, be aware of, the vegetated wetlands and um, the high water mark and things like that, and, and 100 feet from the high water mark and what was allowed in there and what wasn't. So I certainly understand that clearly now and we will abide by that. Um, but as far as the dock is concerned, it's a rather small dock. Um, it's um, sorry, I've got the pictures here. Yeah, I can, I can actually share. I think if this is the one, I believe this is the true one. Oh, there we go. Um, yes, so the, the plan is to come out on a different, um, on one of the other pictures it shows that the dock would be 32 feet long and at the very end, 12 feet wide. Um, yeah, so if by chance the water isn't deep enough at that 32 feet level, it's possible we would have to change the plan and come out further to deeper water, um, but we won't know that until we get the engineer or are able to go out there ourselves and, and measure the water depth. Um, so, so what we're looking at is continuing, correct? Because yes, yes. And you also had a potential issue with endangered species? Yes, and I did um, get the letter back from them. And yes, there is um, endangered species there. So we need to, let's see projects and activities located within priority and or estimated habitat must, re must be reviewed by the division. But beyond that, I'm not sure exactly what they mean and what they need. So I need to call them and find out and you know, continue with this and pursue that. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm continuing on with the DEP. I'm continuing on with the Division of Fisheries and Wildlife. Um, I think what I'm looking for right now is, is that if you all in the commission could look at the plans and tell me, is there something I'm missing or something you don't agree with at this point? Um, because I'd hate to obviously continue to go through this and find out something's not going to work. Um, yeah. so, so I feel just so everyone knows when Janice and I were out there, the, the items we mentioned um, on site would be um, what is to prevent that if the water level drops, 
that however the um, dock is floated or using for flotation, that it doesn't go down and hit the river bottom because then that would end up in being altering land underwater. That's why um, the engineer needs to see what the depth of the water is to see if it needs to be sent out further. Um, we also talked about the where the channel is along there to make sure that it wouldn't, if it had to be extended out, whether or not it would extend into um, the traveled way, um, navigable waters where the boats are, and that the channel, I believe, is on the opposite side of the bank. That's not going to happen there. Okay, so, so that area, we checked that box. We also, as she mentioned, looked at the property. Um, they are not proposing to put a camper there. We did ask them to pull some materials back. We had, there was a, two large trees, which nice conveniently coincided with the 100 feet from the um, high water line. So we asked them to pull things back on that edge. Um, what we will be doing is, so we will need to continue this in order to A, hear from your engineer and B, clear up with the Endangered Species Program. Yes. Okay. So do you think um, we would have this information within, I mean, we can always do two weeks. And if we know that you don't have the information, we would just continue it at the beginning of the meeting. That would be nice if we could plan it for next uh, the two week mark, and then yes, I'll let you know, or we'll we will know that whether we can do it or not. Okay. Yeah. All right, uh, commission okay. members, do you have any questions or comments at this point for the applicant to address prior to the next meeting? No. Okay. No. So. Um, can I have a motion to continue to May 25th? I make a motion. Okay. I'll second it. Continue with the maze. All right. So Steve made the motion. Edwin seconded. Um, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstain? I'm going to abstain because uh, Irene's been a past customer of mine, which I appreciate. And I should probably not be voting on this. Okay. Thanks, Gary. Thank and thank you all. I appreciate all the time and effort that you spend at this. This is a long haul, but um, you know, this year. <laughs> that's what little that. towns are all about is people but, pitching in and doing things. So I appreciate it. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay, have a good night. Thank you. All right, so we then have a request for determination public meeting. P. Stefanowicz seeks to place two campers for seasonal use in the riverfront area and 100 year floodplain at 93 Aquavita Road, map 4A, parcel 22. Who's up for that one? I am. Okay. Whoops. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. Um, I do have a special permit back from 94. Um, we've been there in the, on this property for 29 years. And all I'm seeking is to put my camper in there and enjoy the river. Okay. Um, so on the application, it says two RVs. Right. Yes, that's right. It does. So what we would need, um, I believe Janice sent you a note um, yes. asking for a copy of the special permit that was issued for that. Okay. She said that um, looking at informal lists of permits, it, it did list one for you, Stefanowicz, number 10-94 for one camper. Um, and there were permits or 22 Aquavita lot, lot 22. And I believe that was what your property was taken out of. So mm -hmm. it said three trailers total, one each LaCroix, Stefanowicz and uh, am I saying this right? Braga, Braga? Yeah, yes. <clears throat> mm -hmm. 
So if you are requesting a second trailer, one would fall under the special permit, and then we would need to know um, where the second, so this would be for the second one and the locations of them. So were you able to get Janice a, um, a copy? Yes. Well, I didn't get the email until today. Okay. So I, I don't have it right now, but I will get it. Okay. And I have, um, she had a, a sketch that she created for the request for determination that shows the location of the two campers. And I also sent you two photos from our site visit on a, a, a document. We're doc Okay, so this is what I've got. So if I can share. So is this, I'm not sure if this is what you, the one you're referring to, that's one of them. Okay, so this is, this is the one, this one, or this one? This 93. One? Oh, oh, she's 93. Right. That would be this one right here. <clears throat> yes. Okay, so we're looking at 93. Um, we know that the camper that they had the permit for, or got the special permit for, that one um, was dated prior to the riverfront um, regulations going into effect. Um, we looked at whether or not it could be pulled back to make the 100 feet, and it would require trees to be removed, cut down in order to put them back further. Um, so our thought was, um, A, because the camper had been there and permitted prior to the um, prior to the river rules or riverfront regulations going into effect, that um, removal of the trees or pushing it way back um, wouldn't make sense because it, it's in a location where it's been. Um, but the other one, we would need to look at, make sure that one was 100 feet back can you move one back without cutting trees? I believe so. Yeah, I think try finding that other word doc with the two photos because that shows the two areas. Yep. Okay. And I think that the second one was set back just a little more so it met the hundred feet. Okay, hang on. Far away is a closer one. What? They're both out of a hundred foot? The, the, the one that's been there a long time is just under, I can't remember exactly how many. It was like 90. 90. Yeah, like that, okay. 90. 90. Yeah. No. Wow. They got 90 and a permit, let that go, that's close enough with a permit. And, and the other one's 100 feet, right? Yeah. Yeah, yep. Janice, I have um i've got it you want me to show it yes please okay i don't think you have it though tony lynn i gave her some photos just at the end it's of not the this one no yeah. but that one i guess will be okay yeah. oh i have that that one i have i was looking for go ahead oh sorry why don't you share that okay. Mm -hmm. okay so actually that was i took that from um your other plan but when i see that it looks like the one on the right is the one that we measured i thought yes. there were slightly different places yes. the way i remembered um in the field so that's why if we have if i can interject that was around back then back then it was 89 91 and 93 for the three owners yeah they were permanent for one camper each for three total I don't see a problem adding a fourth, but they had per permits way back then. They split the lot into three, 89, 91, and 93 with the three owners you mentioned, Braga, LaCroix, and Stefanich. And they were each allowed one camper back then. So it only added another camper, which is a fourth one. Right, and that's the one that back, we I'm not sure back then what was allowed, but they got special permit way back then. In the like 90s. Before the Riverville. Right. But the the other one, the second one was added after. 
So I think, um, yeah, I have these. I can share these right now. Go through this quickly. But they've been there for a long time. Mm -hmm. There's enough to... room between them too, right? They're 50 foot wide lots originally. 89, 91, 93, because 150 total frontage. You were split into three 50 foot lots by planning board ZBA. Or it was so this back. Is, yeah, but those, but they want, this would be two campers on one lot. So this yeah. is the, this is the location. These are the trees. This is the big clump of trees and that would have to be removed in order to push it back to make that um, 100 feet. The orange is the Where feet. they were permitted originally. And then... I guess it doesn't show it. The other one... The other one, I believe, was... Is this it right here? This is the area right there? That was a little... Close. Yes. That's yeah. yes. camper. So what we'd be looking at is to pull that one back to here is that a possibility mm -hmm. yeah we got room there. yeah we we have room to do that yeah because that wouldn't in it that one won't interfere with the trees because you've got room here but then you've got on this side it's no if it would be you couldn't do it on this side because of the property line based on what we saw out in the field so this one right here could be pulled back Yes. That yeah. could be. So it Good. seems like we have to continue this, right? It seems possible. I don't know if we need to. Um, um, I, can, I can get a copy of the plan. Why do we have to continue this? Oh, we can do this one? Sorry, yeah, we we're just trying to run together. Let's <laughs> get something going. With this one, because this had a special permit, and this is a location where they've been based on the special permit, this is an additional camper, the one over here. That one would be pulled back. I think that's why I was confused because you were saying you hadn't gotten the special permit yet, right? Uh, I just didn't get a copy of it, but they're on but the list. That, we don't have to wait for that? No. I see. Because we that's have documentation curious. that the permit was issued to this property. Do it. So, and. Do it. Do it. What we would be looking at, so this is, we, we measured, that's our tape, we measured from the mean annual high water line. You can see the river out in the back. Right. This is the area that floods in there, like a backwater area. So um, uh, no. No, this is one, I believe we could issue a permit with the conditions. I'm gonna stop sharing right now. So with the conditions similar to what we've done. Um, I think we could do the same as LaCroix, which you was the person that shared that same. Right. Initial. And those would that would be that. Um, that it the the RV lot number had to be put at the road, had to have a street address at the road between 5-1 and 10-31, um, legally licensed and um, for the RMV, maintained on the lot. Both of them would have to be maintained on the lot in a ready to move condition um, in the event of flooding. Um, location, we would move the second camper, the smaller one back um, equal to or behind the existing um, one that was permitted. Uh, they would have to secure the proper permits as required by building uh, department, board of health, um, fire, or any other departments. Um, let's see. And that um, condition of placement is um, only allowed after town meeting. If it's not approved at town meeting, only one uh, trailer would be allowed because they had the special permit and they'd need to maintain, um, they, well, they are maintaining a minimum 35 feet from the top of bank. They're 90, um, they are much further back than that. Um, 
Let's see, no extension of electrical power. Utility would be allowed. And the maximum vehicles placed um, are two that were on the plan. Any changes would require approval of the Conservation Commission. Um, and installation of a dock is not being requested or allowed at this point in time. Right. That's right. Okay. So. You guys good with that? Motion made to approve. With conditions Second. as discussed. With conditions. Second. Okay, so I have a motion to approve and I have a second. Do I have any further questions or discussions from the commission? Hearing none. Um, do I have all those in favor? I'm sorry, uh, you guys. I know. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. No. I'm not trying to extend things. Um, that I'm just picturing that there was like a a place where the camper used to be. Is it? Can we say like to try to? Does it make sense to ask to do something? Ameliorate that or something? something? Yeah. 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 So. So if you, by pulling the camper back, you'll be removing the materials that are on the ground, correct? Correct. All right, so by doing that, um, you will replant that area? Correct. Okay, is that what you're asking, Tony Lynn? Exactly, thank you. Okay, so we will add that on there. Is that acceptable to the motion in the second? Yep. Fine. Great, thank okay. you. All right, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any, opposed? any abstentions? All right. One down out of uh, about 50. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. right. Next item on the agenda. We'll try and keep moving here. We'll see what we can do. Um, the next one is, all right, and I am going to slaughter this name being Polish. I apologize. Is it Slowicki? Slowicki. Slowicki. Okay. Jane so I'm Jane Slowicki. Slowicki. Okay. Right. So Jane Slowicki to place one camper for seasonal use in the riverfront area and a hundred foot, hundred year floodplain at 27 Honeypot Road. Uh, map one, parcel 14. Let's get started with that. Did you have a special permit for this property? Yes, I have. Okay. And the special permit required, um, it allowed the campers at the top of the bank. We okay, have requested them to move back. Right. And we are going to move. And we are going to move it back a hundred foot rule have you as you told us yep so we looked at that and i'm going to share my screen so i know i've got one picture of the new location and I'm we've been to the arbor vitae this is right. 100 feet here and they would be placing the camper behind that adjacent to or in the proximity of the arbor vitae and there's a big tree maple tree right here yeah so this is a property where they've had um, a permit they exercise that permit and have used that permit um, for many years i'm going to say 20 yes. 25 almost 30 yeah. years yes so um, this is a location Janice, were there more than just this picture here for this I think one? That's the only one I I, yeah. I did there. I'm so sure. for this one, this is the area where the camper would be. It would be relocated. Um, let me see what other ones I have. If I have anything else, we had a sketch. No, we had the ortho photo. Okay, so and you the have the photo on that one. Um, and we are not disturbing anything or not moving anything or nothing else. Yeah. And it's well maintained. Yeah, this is an area that they had, um, as I said, it's been maintained prior pre-existing from the 
Rivers Act. Everyone saw the pictures there. We can um, show you here. I've got a question. If it's a special permit, why do they have to move it back? We are asking everyone because the special permit said that they could put the camper at the top of the bank. And because people did a request for determination, um, we're asking that they move them back the 100 feet. But so if they said no, we, we couldn't really have do anything to file a notice it, correct? Of no, the commission has the right to say no because it's a it's a wetlands issue, not a zoning issue. Right. So the the permit that was issued back in the '90s was under the zoning board. It was not under the um, no permit was received from the conservation commission. So we asked them on site, would they be willing to move the um, campers back the hundred to make that hundred feet? And they were agreeable with that. Okay. Um, you have so, to scroll, scroll up the page a little bit to see the area where the trailer is going to yeah. be. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So right back here. Correct. The area where the camper would be, which moves it back from being up here, right up yep. here, it pushes it back to here, which gets Correct. us out of that hundred feet. And it's well maintained and. And uh, that's the way it, it's done. We, we we mow the lawn every week and keep it clean. Yeah, yeah they they do right. for sure. Well, I I, again, this is one that was in existence and permitted through the zoning prior it. to the uh, riverfront regulations um, going into effect. And we have asked them to comply with the hundred minimum of a hundred feet. They've agreed to that. Um, they have the conditions we just discussed with um, the other applicant. Those, I believe, um, were those, Janice, are those on their permit? I don't believe so. Um, I think some of them are. Some of them are pretty right. standard, having to do with ready to move in a, a, a number at the end of the, of the lot and some of that sort of stuff. Yeah, and we can move that very easily. Yeah, the, yeah, most of those are still the same. Yeah, so that it have to be numbered. They, it's in and out May first, ten th uh, through ten thirty one, has to be legally licensed, maintained, yeah. um, ready to move. Um, we do all that. Yep. Okay. And same thing with the vegetating. The yeah, well the yeah the area here, which is where the camper was, you can see it right there. It is actually has grown in already. Okay. In there. So it would be pushed back to this area back here. So the the only other thing we still have to discuss on this one and the next ones um, is that they're in the natural heritage territory. Um, but the DEP says that it is possible for a commission to approve a request for determination without natural heritage response but not a notice of intent. And I don't normally recommend that we do that if we have any questions on it. But in this case, one of the exceptions is for lawn and landscaped areas. So I expect that they will get the exception, but it will probably take a while because natural heritage is as swamped as we are and DEP is um, right now. So everything's taking longer. So um, that's a it's a possibility. Otherwise, we'll have to wait until they get a response from Natural Heritage, which could be, I don't know, a month or more. Well, so what happens if we approve it and then Natural Heritage says no? Natural Heritage, um, my thought, and Janice, please correct me, because yeah. this was a site that has been used in um, prior to Natural Heritage regulations going in, Mm. And because it's been maintained in a lawn, that they would allow it to be there. Um, we can put a condition on there that um, a copy of the decision from Natural Heritage will be filed with the commission. And if it contradicts, they have to come back to the commission. Yeah, I think that sounds good. Um, so I move 
given all those conditions to approve the request for determination. Second. Second. Do I have any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Good night. Okay, <laughs> thanks for your patience. Yep. All right, sorry. Next on the list is- yeah, We're getting there, folks. Yeah, we're almost there. <laughs> you don't yours up. Actually, so should we take these? We have four in a row that are all Pipchinsky. Um, Dennis, right? Yes. So does anybody have an objection to taking the four of these together? Nope. No. Nope. All right. So we have four requests for determinations of Dennis Pipchinsky um, to place one camper on each lot. Um, in the riverfront and 100 year floodplain, um, we have 21 honeypot, 29 honeypot, 31 honeypot, and 33 honeypot. Correct. All right. And let me see if I can find those. Are, there, are those parcels, Paula and Janice, the ones that are 13, 1, 2, 12A, and 12 in the in the uh, diagram attached to the RDA? Uh, 16, 1, 16. 16, 2, 15, and 12, I believe it is. 16, 1, 16, yeah. 2, 15, and 12. Yes. And I don't see a 12, but I see the other one. Well, the 12 is way down there. That's the only one that has a street address on it, and it's kind of outlined. OK. But all the others, it's not clear. I just had a hard time understanding which parcel was which, but maybe I was just looking at one RDA. Each one has, yeah, each one is outlined differently. With their parcel. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So if I share my screen, I can give you an overview. <clears throat> so there is the 16 1, which is here, 16 2. And then what were the other numbers? 15? 15 and, and then 12, which is, is, there, it is that one. Right. The one, the last one with the dot in it. Yeah, so right there. All right. Those are the properties um, for that one. Let me see if I've got anything else here. Sorry. That's the application. I can't remember what I gave you anymore. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go back to that. Yep. All right. So, um, Dennis, can you please um, tell the commission members while I'm looking for my information? Looking to get one camper per lot and move it back. Everything will be beyond the um, 100 feet. Um, all these <clears throat> all these lots had previous um, variances for, the, for those parcels. They've all been used for camping for 30 years and they're all lawn area. So this is, let's see if I can share. So there's, there's one exception to that that Paulette and I agreed to. On the easternmost um, property, going back 100 feet and it's in one of the Word documents that I sent, going back 100 feet, you end up in the asparagus field and um, instead, I think it was right around 60 or so feet if you stayed just outside the asparagus field. I don't remember the exact amount, something 60 or 70, I think. Yes. Um, so we, we were making an executive decision out there that, you know, being Hadley and wanting to protect our asparagus fields and farmland in general, that we weren't going to make them give up part of his field to plop the trailer down in it. Um, so he's going to move it as, as close to the field, but not in it as he can to get away from the, um, the bank. And that Which parcel is that, Janice? That's uh, the 12, 12. this eastmost one. 12. Oh, the longest. Okay, eastmost. Yep. Yep. Long right. and thin. Um, yep. Okay. 
That sounds good. Yep. And I see there's the, one of them at least had the previous 95. Uh, yeah, all four yeah. of them had um, special, permit, special permit, that same yeah. special permit, 95. Yep. I don't know what month all it is, but and May. The 16 two um, mm -hmm. actually has a pavilion which was mm -hmm. constructed and this is going to be removed. The okay. structure itself is going to be removed. And let's see if I can do this. It is going to be moved back um, behind where we were standing right over here. Um, what yep. they have uh, asked is that because there is a cement pad there, to be allowed to keep the cement pad, but then do um, plantings and restoration along other areas in here with native species. Uh, I believe they were talking about planting um, blueberries. Tony Lynn, I don't know if you have any other suggestions for them. I like blueberries. <laughs> Yeah, and I can, hi Dennis, thanks for your patience. Um, I can drop off a, a document for you too if you want to check out some other ideas, but that blueberry sounds great. Um, a lot of kids are um, there, they like blueberries. Yeah, there you go. Um, I'm a little confused about why we're having him move the pavilion and not the cement, like, well, I mean, pavilion, is there a point of because the pavilion creates a little shade or what? Well, the pavilion was never permitted for one building or conservation, and they are actually going to be shifting it back um, or moving it back. And they had the question was, do we want them? They had re asked, do we want them to remove the concrete pad? Or could it stay there and could they do restoration equal to the square footage of what's there because it's within the first hundred feet? And also the camper that was here on this um, is being moved behind the Arborvitae. Um, there's an opening in there where they still have their views um, and that will be pushing it back um, I believe a hundred feet. The upper photo. Is that hundred mm. feet? If you scroll up. But so to so to be clear, the slab wasn't permitted either. No. <laughs> so we're just saying we're making a choice to say that it's less disruptive to have yes. it removed and costly and everything else. And then on the new location of the pavilion, there won't be a slab, presumably, or will there be? I'm not planning on putting any cement under it. Okay. Just, yep, just to be clear. Yep. Okay, so then we're asking for mitigation for mitigation. the cement that is the staying slab. in place. Got it. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Thanks, yep. Jim. So it would be equal to the square footage of the slab in the planting areas. Sounds reasonable. Yep. Okay. And again, this is one that had the permit. Um, and because this, the pavilion had not been permitted, that is why we asked um, for it not to be there. And they were willing to move the camper beyond the 100 feet. Well, again, I just want to be clear. So if they, I mean, I don't, I can't figure out why it matters if they move the pavilion, if they're not going to get rid of the cement, unless you're thinking about the water storage above ground, Paulette, because it's well, like if they leave, either are permitted and one of them staying in the one that is right. Yeah. Well, two, th two things. One, if the pavilion stays, um, it would have to go through notice of intent for compensatory storage. Okay. Okay, that I was thinking. So right. that, that would be one reason. The cement slab, because it's at grade, it is not, it was excavated and it's equal to the ground around it. There is no need for compensatory storage for the slab. So that that's the reason for that. Okay, thanks. I understand. Mm -hmm. And just having a structure is I know the concrete probably does more damage than the, the structure. Than the, than the structures, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, 
but the structure, I, I, for one thing, it sets a really bad example for everybody else up and down the, the Yeah, river. it also is, I was going to say, you can see it from a lot part of the <laughs> slab. Yeah, no, it all makes sense. So, and um, right. at this point, the removal of the slab would probably uh, Yeah, it's more disruptive. A lot yeah, more expensive. impact and, yeah. in that area and potential because it is close to the bank, the top of the bank here, it would um, potentially removing it, excavating it, um, and I think doing the restoration there, the plantings equal to the square footage of it. And I know you, we have that information. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing for a second. We had that information given to us. Dennis, do you know what the square footage of that is off the top of your head? I know you gave it to us in writing. 26 by 23. Okay, so 26 by 23. The square footage would be um, equal to the, the restoration and the plantings would be in there, equal to that area. Okay. I feel like this is straightforward. Yep. Right. So that's one. So there's three others. So the the first one we talked about was um, just trying to see. So this is the one. The picture is asparagus field. Is yeah. the asparagus field right? Yeah. Um, the other two are. Yeah. So the asparagus field. I'll show you that one quick. If they moved it back the hundred feet it would be, here's the edge of the field, it would have to go back way up into here. Good. And by allowing it, because originally when it was permitted through the special permit, it was at the top of the bank. And that's where they've had it in the past and they are willing to move it, pull it back from there. If you scroll down, you can see the, the old location. Oh, and it's, there we go. It's going to be yes. close to the same, but it's going to so, be a little further back, right. as far back as he can go and stay out of the field. Yeah. So this is the area here where it was, and then it will be pulled back here. Great. Right. Okay. And then he was going to do um, some in because it's not quite at the hundred feet. He was going to do additional plantings along this area also. Sounds good. Okay. And then the last one. Sorry, I'm just. I don't know if I have another one. Okay. Nope, those were my those were my pictures. Okay. So can we we have the same issue with the natural heritage. So we can yeah. decide the same thing if you want about it. Because again, it appears to be a lawn landscaped area for a significant period of time. Yes, yeah, so again, right. just request that it gets uh, we get filed with us. Yep, yeah, we get a copy of the natural heritage decision. And if natural heritage requires additional changes, they would have to come back to the Conservation Commission. So moved. Okay, with previous conditions, Yes. Put on the other um, properties. Right. Okay. So I have a motion. With conditions. Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay. We have a second. Any further discussion? Who made the motion? Sorry. Gary. Gary okay. made the motion. Okay. All right. Do we have any other discussions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hmm. All right. We are Thanks almost for there. sticking People. with us, Dennis. Sorry yeah. it took so long. Okay, yeah. so this is our last one. All right. We've got request for determination for Jay Sykowski. Am I saying that right? Sykowski? Yep. yep. He, Shaikowski, because I have Cheslick, so seeks to construct a dual use solar array on a two acre field in the buffer zone off of Shattuck Road, map 13, parcel 43. Who is here to present? 
I am uh, Jake Marley. So I'm presenting on Joe Zukowski's behalf this evening. I told him about two hours ago um, that we probably would not be seen tonight. So um, I think he is in bed and probably getting up in a few hours. Um, so thank you all. I, I can dive right into the presentation. Um, I have a couple of slides. Uh, they're mostly just images. I'll provide some language and then I can answer uh, the questions that have been presented by DEP and by the Conservation Commission so far. So I'll screen share now. Can you all see the PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. So this is the area that we're looking at. Um, it is on the corner of Shattuck Road and uh, Commons. Uh, well, I should back up first. Thank you all for the opportunity to present tonight and thank you for your time last week uh, during the site visit on Tuesday. So the area that we're looking at is um, about two acres over here on Shattuck and Commons Road. Uh, the current land use is row crop, crops on a rotational basis. Um, he, Joe has um, grown corn, sweet corn, shade tobacco, squash, things of that nature uh, in this field in the past. The overall field is about eight and a half acres and currently about five acres of it um, are farmed. This area over here is um, pretty wet and so it's also not ideal for turning machinery around. So that's about two and a half acres. Um, moving to the next slide. So um, Wendell Wetland Services, uh, Ward Smith flagged this area. There are hydric soils over on this Eastern portion and then there's a drainage ditch over here. Um, Eaton Associates perform, perform the uh, uh, survey of the area. So this green line is the drainage ditch. This represents, this Eastern edge represents um, the hydric soil area. And this is a 35 foot setback line. Um, so all of the work will be, uh, none of it will be within the buffer zone and none of it will um, take place on the uh, hydric soils either. This is the next slide. So this is the um, proposed uh, array. It's not on, so what we owe to the Conservation Commission is an overlay of this site on the 35 foot setback, demonstrating that we will not be within the uh, buffer zone area. Um, the overall project size will be 480 KWDC. The land will not be taken out of production for the duration of the array um, for the 20 years. Um, the Do you wanna explain why? Yeah, sure. So the um, land will not be taken out of production. So in order to meet state requirements, it needs to meet annual reporting requirements. And so there is um, an incentive for both the developer for Hyperion and for Joe uh, in order to keep this in production or, or in order to receive compensation, it needs to be kept in production and meet MDAR, Mass Department of Ag Resource requirements for uh, considered annual reporting. So there, there's an incentive for both parties, for all parties to continue using this land. Um, the current uh, proposal is for Joe to move his chicken operation production uh, to this site. And so that will be on a rotational basis. We have um, submitted an application to um, MDAR that has more language. We can provide that to the commission as well. And so there's no fence that's being proposed for this site. Joe will have a rotational fence um, and that will be um, used as paddocks as, as that's rotated throughout the year. Um, typically, Joe has the chickens come in in four different stages beginning in June and then every couple of weeks um, rotating out through August. And he can provide more specifics on those details um, in the fall in the subsequent meeting. Um, Joe will have um, different uh, cover crops that he'll use, such as buckwheat, oat, and rye. Um, and chickens are actually a pretty eco-friendly method of tilling the soil. Um, the chickens will not eat the entire root of the uh, cover crops and will actually increase uh, water retention and organic matter throughout the 20 years, uh, the duration of the system. Um, so this is an example. The commission asked a couple of uh, times for pictures of existing dual use or agrivoltaic arrays. Um, Hyperion has installed these different types of systems. This is one in uh, South Deerfield, Mass. It's actually on the UMass Cafe site. Um, it, this was installed in 2010. Um, and this was in collaboration with UMass, of course, and has been supported over the years by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. I should mention and back up um, this site that Joe's project, uh, Joe's project will be part of a National Renewable Energy Laboratory research and also a uh, separate UMass uh, project that's 
being presented or, or supported by four different developers in the state. And that will look at the economic benefits of ag agrivoltaic solar. So not taking land out of production. Hmm. And this is a final, so this is what the um, single axis tracker array will look like. This is an example of a project in Georgia. Um, this is for, I believe it's for hay, but it demonstrates the height of the overall modules because that's something that had come up last week at the site visit. And these so, are not, Ed, you, you kind of just breezed over it. These are not stationary, these will track. Yes. Um, so these will track east to west. Um, so it's more efficient per acre. So there's actually it, it's creating more kilowatt hours of renewable energy by tracking the sun east to west throughout the day. And as oh. you can see, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. So can you go back to the previous slide? Yes. So those aren't the same height. So, so the, the, the UMass, you know, you've got a couple, there are a couple of rows, of like two or three rows, right, at, at UMass? Correct. And those are at what height, like seven, eight feet? Seven to eight feet in height. And then the other one, your other slide is, is what's the height of that? That is about 10 feet. And the, and the proposed project is the 10 foot height. Yes, that's correct. It's 10 feet to the panel horizontal. And it has to be that high in order to meet state minimum uh, requirements. And will these be installed with concrete footings at all, or how would they be installed? We're proposing no concrete footings at all. There'll be, um, you can see here, th this site does have concrete, you can see here. Um, and how we'll achieve that is by beefing these up basically to be a six by 15 or a six by 20 um, I-beam or H, H pile that'll be installed using standard uh, construction or farming equipment. Um, and that will, the, the beam size or the H pile size will be determined upon a geotechnical uh, report. So once, assuming we get approved for everything, we'll have to do a pull test, what's known as a pull test or a geotechnical analysis. Um, so we'll install the poles two weeks later, we'll come back and, and remove the poles. And then from there, there's some analysis work that's done to tell us if it has to be a six by 15, uh, six by 20 will definitely meet snow load and wind requirements. And just so everyone knows, while um, we were out on the site, we did mention to them about the Hadley winds that come through here. So that they should be beefed up for that. So I can jump now from these slides to the different questions um, that Jana sent over. Uh, am I still sharing my screen? You are. Okay. If I, I can end the screen sharing if that's preferred okay. or just run through these. That's fine. Okay. Um, so all those plans, so these are from the DEP. Um, I should mention um, Mark Stinson um, from the DEP provided these first six questions. Um, so we're finalizing plans that will include, um, as I said, the setback requirements with the um, row layout. So uh, any plans going forward will have the arrows pointing north on them. Um, where will the electricity generated go used for on uh, farm or put into the grid, how high off the ground will the bottom of the panels be in order for the farm equipment to be used. Um, so the power will go back to the grid. Hyperion is currently communicating with local off takers. Uh, we've also begun conversations with a local aggregation company. And so the aggregator will actually um, help us keep track or, or um, compile some of these different off takers. Uh, the worst case scenario is for the power to basically just go back to the grid, go back to Eversource. Um, it's more renewable energy that's created, um, reducing our carbon impact. And, and so that's the worst case, the best case scenario. And then it would be used um, in some other Eversource territory. The best case scenario is that it's signed on for specific off takers um, to utilize that power. Um, so bottom of the panels will be 10 feet to horizontal at maximum tilt. It's about eight feet off the ground, but that's very, that's um, dawn or dusk at, at the um, maximum tilt angle. And so Joe, Joe has farming equipment. Well, that's a question we'll get to uh, a little bit later. Uh, oh no, right here. Joe, Joe um, has farming equipment already. Uh, for example, his John Deere 5,500 utility tractor. Um, most of the harvesting in the fields will be done by hand anyway. So he'll have wagons or tractors out there to collect um, the different crops or, or of course, if it's chickens, um, those will be rotated by, by hand as well. 
um, transmission lines to the farm and or grid. So I shared an image with um, the conservation earlier, uh, earlier today that highlights where the transmission line will be, uh, the trench line out to the street, out to Shattuck Street. And we reviewed that plan on site. There's an existing farm access road, which is part of the reason um, we, we've been working with Joe for about two years in developing this plan. Um, part of the attraction to the site is the existing farm access road. So there's no, um, or it's site mitigation, uh, minimal land dis or area disturbance, I suppose. Uh, so there will be a utility pole with a transformer that will be required to be installed on Shattuck Street on the corner of that existing farm access road. And then the trench line will follow that along. It's about 850 feet out to the site. The northwest corner um, is where the um, inverter pad will be. Can you maybe move it back to the first photo, the first slide or something? Because that'll show sort of the area too. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so here's the existing farm access road. And so that's what the trench line will be right along there out into this, into the proposed area. There is, um, we did find out there is a, a drain through here. So we'll have to, Hyperion will contact um, Dig Safe and they'll come out and mark it. And that part of the trench will have to be um, hand dug. Um, okay. So this is the fourth question from DEP. Um, this area is within rare species habitat. Power generator goes into the grid. It, uh, the work is likely not exempt from agricultural activity and reviewed by NHGSP. Um, so Hyperion is contracted with um, SWCA and Dr. Steve uh, Johnson has performed the habitat assessment report and we submitted it to um, an NHGSP officer on the 27th and we have a, a meeting scheduled for next week. Um, to review the project in, in sort of a preliminary conversation. Um, it's been indicated to me by um, Mark that um, because this is an RFD a request for determination, it's, it can be ruled upon uh, by the Conservation Commission prior to uh, NAGSP finalizing their decision. Um, next question. Um, so this was- just at the, Sorry, just to hold there for a second. So from our paperwork, it looks like this might be spade foot habitat. Um, it feels different than what we just talked about for um, Dennis's or the other um, campers. Uh, agriculture is exempt. When agriculture is exempt, so this is exempt. Well, yeah, I don't know if they're getting an agricultural exemption um since it is also solar i know it's the combined use but i guess that's something natural heritage will have to decide on that mm -hmm. i'm sorry to i'm sorry to have just skip I, I didn't mean to um you know skip over that or imply that we were going to get a final determination tonight uh, that's I, I didn't expect that um mm -hmm. yeah good because there were a few yeah you're still going to get still waiting for plans out. right yeah well, we have to overlay the plan yes of, of the array oh. on um the site survey and, and also you still need to talk to planning board. Apparently it still requires a special permit. You kick in because of the amount. I don't know if it's acreage. Uh, yeah, if it's over an acre, you need to check with them about a special permit, they said. So that will also decide whether they make you do some kind of screening or fencing or whatever too. Maybe not, I don't know, but at any rate. Well, we don't need that. I mean, we can rule independent of planning board, right? Yes. We're not waiting for that. What we're waiting for is the new plan and natural heritage not, too. And natural, and and natural heritage, right? Going to alter anything. Right. Okay. So is it appropriate to continue um, with Conservation Commission? I've reached out to Bill DeWire and Joe has had conversations with Bill as well about this site. Um, more anecdotal than my formal communication with Bill. And he pointed me in the direction of the special permit. Um, my thought process has been continuing the conversation in parallel with Conservation Commission and NHESP prior to um, engaging planning board. I'm, I'm happy to pursue that process. Yeah, I think that if you, um, Conservation Commission, because there are wetlands, wetland soils adjacent to it, um, you are going to need this. They won't, planning board typically doesn't issue a permit until you've been through conservation commission. Right. 
So um, I think you should continue here. Okay. Um, and we can, I mean, my understanding is we are not going to end this tonight. Mm -hmm. So because we need those, those plans or information from you. Right. So if we can, if you're going to have that information in two weeks, we'll continue it for two weeks. That would not stop you from starting your process with the planning board. Understood. That would be, um, that would be greatly appreciated if we could continue this in two weeks and we should have the plan. So um, further in, in this explanation, um, we've contracted with Solar Design Associates. Um, they're based in Harvard, Mass. Um, they're definitely a reputable uh, solar design uh, firm and they're, they're helping us um, overlay the rows onto the plan that Eaton Associates uh, provided to us. Um, and, and while this is going on in the next two weeks, we'll start engaging the conversations uh, more thoroughly with uh, the planning board. And as I mentioned, next week, we have the conversation with NHESP. Um, we can continue going through these. Um, I, whatever is preferred, it's, it's pretty late here. I think we're pretty shot. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. It, it, it really comes down to uh, Hyperion owes, um, owes you all the plants uh, is what I would basically summarize it. And, and I would also like um, in two weeks, the opportunity, I'll, I'll um, request that Joe's on as well so he can mm -hmm. speak to some of this, um, what we've been developing for quite a while. Have you put your responses in, in writing yet? I've, I've been getting things, you know, flooding. Um, so I don't, I don't remember if I've gotten the written response to comments yet or not. Have I or not? Yes, yes, I did oh. send it back. I'm sorry, um, okay. I sent it back today. Oh, okay, well, I didn't see that one yet. No, it's all right, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I should have sent it earlier. <laughs> okay, okay, good. I'm not totally crazy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Right, so we will, we've got the, your comments. Um, we need to continue because we need the overlay. Um, endangered and because of, to hear from natural heritage. Right, so we need to, to do that. Um, do you think you'll have everything in two weeks? I don't think that natural, I don't know what the process is like for natural heritage um, or, or what their response time will be like. I can pass along any information um, outcomes from that meeting that we have next week. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then we can see how it goes. If it doesn't look like they're gonna require any changes, then you're fine. If there's gonna be a dramatic change of some kind, um, then you might wanna wait. Otherwise you'll have to file all over with us again. Right. Uh, if there's a change. So that's the only reason to, you know, be cautious about that. Understood. Hey, I'm, I'll make a motion to continue. I think we're there. I'll second yeah. it. Okay, we have motion to, and a second. Do we have any more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Oh, okay. oh so we're continuing to what? To the 20th? 25th. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. And Thanks, James. We'll know if it's going to go any further. Yep. Dennis, do we have things that we can, can we put everything <laughs> off? Is there anything? Do you have bills. hours that have yeah, to be? Hours, <laughs> okay. So, can you authorize? Can the commission authorize me to sign for Janice's hours? So moved. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. Got a motion and a second. Aye. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. We can move the minutes to um, June. Yep. Uh, Everything uh, else goes. Um, next two weeks. Yep. Anything else anybody wants to say? Nope. 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 I'm sorry. I know everyone's tired. Janice, there's something about the sign. Did you get the sign? No, not yet. I keep okay. it on there just to keep myself pushing for it. Okay. But thanks. I keep running out of time. <laughs> Thank you all very much for your time. Thank all you. right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, so I need a motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn. Okay. Second. Second. I got a second. Any further discussion? All those in Aye. favor? Aye. Bye. 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 Bye.